Now I'd like to call call to order of the city council meeting dated uh, Wednesday, August the 5th. Uh, we will have um, our invocation led by uh, Commissioner Vincent Williams and followed um, by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martin. Will you, uh, will you do the um, Pledge of Allegiance for us, please? Sure. Okay. Commissioner Williams? Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come now and thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for this opportunity together by Zoom and to conduct the business of the city of Brunswick. Father, we thank you for this beautiful city in which we live, and we thank you for people of this community. Father, we pray that every decision that we make tonight will be for the best interest of all those involved. We love you and we give you great praise and thanks. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Man. All right, I have to do this standing. So okay. even though I don't, I don't have a flag, I'm gonna pretend there is one. Okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Commissioner Williams as well. Um, as we get started on our meeting tonight, is there any items that we need to add to our agenda? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I will make a motion to add to the agenda as item number 12A under the city manager's item to consider approval of community development block grant disaster recovery program the grant consultant contract. Second. Okay, probably most of second to add to item 12A on the city manager's uh, item, approval of the community development block grant disaster recovery program, CDBGDR grant consultant contract. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, our motion carries. Again, like I said, we'll add that as item number 12A. And then I believe there was another item, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'll make a motion to um, amend the agenda to include as item number 12B under the city manager's item, resolution number 2020-14. Is that correct? For the, That's correct. Uh, okay. That's correct. To authorize the execution of the coronavirus relief fund terms and conditions of the agreement. Second. Motion second to add item uh, number 12B uh, on the city manager's item, authorization to execute the coronavirus relief fund terms and conditions agreement. For the discussion, hearing the all in favor say aye. 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 All right, uh, <laughs> that motion carries. We add that item to be item 12B uh, on the city manager's item. Okay, I believe that's all we have to add to our agenda at this at this moment at this time. Uh, we will our first item on our agenda is an item to consider for approval. Consider approval of July 15, 2020, regular scheduled meeting minutes. Um, it's in our package. At enclosure one, um, we all should have had an opportunity to peruse it. But if you need a minute or two, you can. And not uh, entertain a motion. Please. I'll make a motion. We approve the minutes. Second. Second. It's probably motion second for the approval of the regular scheduled minute scheduled meeting minutes of July fifteenth. Further discussion or comments? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed have the same sign, same right. Since there's no opposed, it seems like the ayes have it. Okay, we move right along to item number two. Consider approval or renewal for additional flood insurance. Ms. Lynn Beely will be presenting. Yes, good evening. Um, every year at this time, I bring before you these um, flood insurance policies to give me permission to renew again. Um, 
these are additional flood insurance policies in addition to the $10 million in flood coverage that we have through GERMA for property and equipment. That GERMA coverage, if you'll recall, um, you voted to approve at the May 6th commission meeting. And that coverage period is May 1st of each year to May 1st of the next year. So we have 10 million in flood coverage through GERMA. Um, the horizontal spreadsheet that you'll see along with my staff report is the detail of the policies that I'm putting before you tonight to approve. The, um, we have three policies with the National Flood Insurance Program, and they cover three specific buildings, as you can see from the spreadsheet. And then we have a Lloyd's of London policy that covers other of our buildings. Um, McGinney and Gordon prepares this summary for us, and you can see this year's coverage versus last year's coverage. Nothing has changed as far as our coverage. Um, the only thing that has changed is the flood insurance premium went up in total approximately 5%, and we kind of anticipated that. Um, the increase amounts to dollar-wise about $1,700, and these policies were figured into the budget number, um, so we are covered budget-wise. But I also wanted to point out to you, with these policies and our GERMA policies, that gives us coverage of almost $15 million property and equipment. Um, so I think that's, that's important to note that we do have that much and in speaking with Fred McGinney, he said that he felt like that was a good amount of coverage in the event that we were to have flood damage. Um, so what I have before you tonight is a request for you to approve the renewal of these additional flood insurance policies at a cost of $35,611.74, which is covered under our fiscal year 2021 budget. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Vili. Uh, the Finance Committee, can you uh, have anything to say about this? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, we we did uh, review this. Uh, we did find out that it's already in our budget for the budget year, and uh, we didn't have a problem with moving it forward before the full commission. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments on on the presentation? Yeah, you know, the only thing I would say is is that uh, Lynn, I wonder if if the deductibles have been checked on all these and when the last time they were they were checked. Um, checked in what way um, to make sure that they're adequate or yeah that, that that you know if the if we can raise a deductible you know that, that would help us right um actually when when these policies come up for renewal especially the national flood insurance policies they give you options as far as your deductibles Mm -hmm. And Fred, through his advice, um, we kept them the same this year. You know, we had the option of raising, um, I guess, lowering the deductible, which would raise the insurance. And his advice was to leave them the same. So every renewal period, we, Fred does, and, and I as well do look at the deductibles and see, weigh that against our premium cost. Okay, all right. And I mean, that's a great question, Commissioner Kaysen, and it could be that maybe next year, since we've had 
these these increases that perhaps next year might be a good year to look at raising some of the deductibles and lowering the premium well it, it wouldn't hurt to ask the question anytime really and truly uh you know uh we, we're going to need cash, and, and this is a way to, to look at it. If we don't do it now. Uh, that actually would go the other way. We'd have to raise the deductible to lower the premium. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what that's, I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Raise the deductible. no matter how we'd look at it anyhow. Yeah, okay. In order to yeah. lower the premium. If I misspoke, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah. that would no no definitely you're all right basically what we're doing is you know they gave us several options we weren't given an option like you're talking about but we can certainly explore that you don't ask they're not going to give it to you lynn that's you're right you're, yes sir. You're, you're not going to be eligible so i i would say to do that we need insurance we're in we're in hurricane season so I'd be sure we're covered, but I would ask the questions and just see what it's worth to us. We'll do that. Okay, so here we are. Do we want to um, go ahead and um, um, get a motion to carry this forward and make sure that we moving forward for our next year that uh, we put that as a requested item that we make sure that we ask for uh, to look at all deductibles um, for moving forward. May I make a motion to approve the um, renewal for our additional flood insurance as presented? Second. Okay, my problem. Motion second for the renewal of our additional flood insurance as presented, which has been uh, went uh, been voted upon to by the finance committee to move to the, the full commission. Um, are there any further questions or comments? Here in the all in favor, please say aye. 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 Julie, did you vote? I did. I said aye. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, all, all opposed have the same same right. No one opposed. Seems like the ayes have it. Therefore, that motion carries. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Vealy. You're welcome. Uh, item number three, consider approval of finance reports as of June 30, 2020. Ms. Kathy Mills, our finance director, will be presenting. Yes, sir. Um, you have before you the financial statements for June 30th, which is, of course, our fiscal year end. So, I do want to make a point, though, that these are unaudited numbers and there will be some adjustments made. Um, as we do some accruals at year end, but um, on basically a cash basis at this point, we have a year to date revenues over expenditures of $533,000. We have a cash balance. Um, let me explain this a little bit. We have 312,000 at, we have 3.4 million at Georgia Fund One that is for general fund expenses, or basically. And then I also have 300,000 in Georgia Fund One that I have restricted on the general ledger for the sale of the Perry Park property, which happened at the very end of June. You'll remember that sale was for $600,000. $300,000 was um, written out to the URA, and that was done before the end of, of the fiscal year. And the other 3,000, which the city was keeping, I think at the time we did it, we had anticipated that we would possibly buy some more property with those funds. So I wanted to set them up in a restricted account so it wouldn't just get lost in um, the general fund revenue. So um, that money is also at Georgia Fund One. Um, local option sales tax, um, for the month we were down 8.07%, which was not bad considering that um, this is another COVID expense month. And um, I was pretty pleased that it was only down 8%. Year to date, we were up 0.13%. Um, so I think if we had not had the, the COVID problems that we would have been um, you know, over our last year's 
um, comparison with lost year to date. Title ad valorem tax, of course, we've known this for a long time. It was 28% down for the month. Year to date, 53% down from the prior year. Um, the Georgia legislature did pass a bill that will give us a higher percentage. We will not see the effects of that until we get our first distribution in August, which will be for July, which I guess July 1st was the date. Um, so um, we will see. I will tell you now though, in terms of the local option sales tax, we have already received that for the month of um, for the month of June. And we actually, that which came in in July, the end of July, and it was actually higher than it's been for the past, over the past year. So yeah. I know, I, I, I don't know exactly why, but we will take that. Yes. Um, on your second page, you have SPLAW 6. Uh, year to date, we have our total cash balance of six and a half in the bank. Um, during the month of June, we did pay out almost $1.5 million. Um, a good bit of that, 271,000 went on ditches, 860,000 went on the streets, 21,000 on cemeteries, 34,000 at Sydney Lanier Park, 95,000 at Overlook Park, um, 36,000 went out to pay um, the equipment for the 911 system, um, and 80,000 to the fire department. So a lot of that money um, going out. Uh, I will make the point that if you look up at the top for revenue collections, the budget for SPLOS 6 was $13.8 million. We have currently collected $13.5 million. And so we still have the months of, we have still have four more months because our last, um, our last amount will come in in October because this loss ends in September 30th. So we are well on our way what we had originally budgeted, which is a good thing. So um, I guess at some point we will, I'm sure the city manager will have some suggestions on what we can do with those, um, those overages. On the next page, you have SPLOS 5, which is basically around the some interest last month. There's a balance available of $1.4 million. Um, Norwich Street Commons, no expenditures during this year. Uh, the only thing that has gone on in there is we have earned interest on that account. There is $731 at Prime South and $334,000 at Fund, Georgia Fund One. Roosevelt Harris Multipurpose Center. We have a cash balance down at the bottom of $11,165. We'll see grant money $196,000. We did transfer in from the general fund $105,000. I believe we had budgeted for the year to transfer thousand, but uh, when went back and looked, and we did not make, get quite as much revenue on our um, program income and our seniors. I'm sorry. There's four of them, but all the rest of them are in somewhere else. Okay. Um, and so that was why we were a little short there. Okay. So feed those dogs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Two of them are out in the yard, and I couldn't get the other two to move. All right. The sanitation. We have a total cash on hand of $564,000. I also have a restricted account for the sanitation fund. I have $193,000 in Georgia Fund One for the remainder on the T Street landfill, which um, has not been called for yet through the escrow account. Um, but uh, we expect that to happen um, within the next year. So that money has been set aside for that. Um, sanitation bills roughly run $121,000 a month. You'll see all the expenditures year to date there for $1.4 million. Stormwater utility, I will say we have a net balance of um, 293000 291000 in cash, um, which is at a much better point than we have been previously. If you'll remember the last couple of years, we've had to loan the stormwater utility fund some money from the general fund until taxes came in. I think we're fine there. We will not have to do that this year. It does not appear. Um, the only expenditures from the 
Um, the additional information is for the rec department, there was $612 spent on some aquatics equipment. The last page, you'll see the Roosevelt Lawrence Center, and we have monthly expenses of $7,300. Um, the majority of that money was for the um, salaries for the, for the center. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those. Any questions for our, our finance director? Mr. Mayor, I have a question, but I think this may go to our uh, city attorney concerning the SPLOS and the uh, overage um, and the legal uh, legal ramifications of that as far as the county collecting additional SPLOS dollars. Um, and we've reached our, I, I think we've pretty close to what we uh, anticipated receiving. And then I was trying to figure out what the law or uh, how was it, are we approved by law to accept any more funds over what we were anticipating getting? Well, I, I mean, the the limitation on SPLOS collection would be if it was still being collected. So I'm assuming, you know, this is just money that's being generated through interest, correct? No, sir. The, no, no, no. It's actually being collected up through um, the end of the September. End of Oh, this is the most recent uh, SPLOS. Well, yes, I don't know. I, I don't know. the amount had not been reached yet, by law, they have to continue it. Right. I'd have to go take a look at the the um, referendum and the ballot. Because it's, yeah, because the of, referendum yep. does not say that, nor does the ballot. They do not say that it will stop once the budgeted amount has been reached. Now, if there's anything in the law, and actually I looked at the ballot the other day and it also does not say anything. It just says it will stop in 14 quarters, which I guess was at that point, September 30th. It does not say on the ballot that once the, so I don't know if that's a law that even if it doesn't say that will happen. I'd have we'll to see, go and, in that, and look, look at it. That was Sorry. a question. That was a question. That was a question that um, that I also had regarding um, the distribution and the percentages of distribution and um, how the arrangement or agreement is currently in place um, because I, I received some information that um, uh, that there was some consideration of, of changing the percentages of how it's now being distributed because of that very point. Okay, I would have to go back. I mean, I, I, I'd want to go back and review the documentation um, before I make a, a, a legal opinion on the matter. So if there's a, after tonight, I could go back and kind of look and, and make a determination on that. I wasn't aware of the issue until right this moment. Okay, and, and, and I think that's pretty much um, why it's been uh, brought to your awareness is so that that right. research can can be done and uh, we can get clarity on where we stand. Okay. Yes. I mean, I'd be happy to look into it, obviously. So I will do that after tonight. Okay. <clears throat> what what I've heard is is that the city and the county will share in the additional funds that that come in due to the date uh, cutoff not being. Uh, made properly, and the Joint Water Sewer and the Jekyll Island will not participate in that additional funding. That seems to be, because I think that they, this one was not capped at an amount, it was capped at a date, if I, if I remember correctly. I, and that would mean that, and I think that Joint Water and Sewer and Jekyll were capped at amounts, and then that would if that's the case, they would stop at their amounts. That's now, correct. again, I really want the opportunity to go back and look at everything, but if that's the case, the remainder would fall back to, uh, as Commissioner was saying, the population uh, breakdown, that percentage that we agreed to it, well, we didn't agree to it, it was forced upon us, but the percentage population that was done when the SPLOS was enacted. But I, that is, with heavy caveats that I would need to go back and look at all the documentation first. Yes, please, definitely, because we yeah. want to make sure that that we are we we we're, we're being um, 
that duly compensated. That it, that it, yes, duly compensated. Everything is um, above board and it's um, equitable as it should be. Okay. Because this was not like the lost where it was based on that. The, the lost, we were told what our maximum amount was as was Jekyll Island, as was Joint Water Sewer. So it, it wasn't based on population to my, to my understanding. That's, that's different. This blast was based on population. Yeah, it was. Really? It was. Yes, they, it, it, it started out it not was. Being, but then it, it ended up being based on. Correct. Okay. Now, now, with all of this, the county stands to have a bigger share because Joint Water and Sewer and Jekyll Island won't get a share, so they will get a larger share. We just get our percentage, whatever it's going to be. Okay. Uh, of that. So we All still right. will get our percentage, uh, but uh, it would be a little larger because the other two won't share in it, and the county will get extra share too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was my question, and really my concern is was there going to be uh, additional negotiations for that additional funding, or, or we, would we just go with the agreement that we have and the same percentages. It'd be good to go back and negotiate if we can. So Brian, uh, please check on that part. Um, my, my question to this is that since we did not have this budget, uh, I mean, allocated for a specific project, uh, what are we going to do with those funds? Do, do we, do we decide where we want to put those additional funds? Again, a question that I would probably need to go back and I just would, would like to review the law before I answer. Okay. It would, and gut, you know, would be that it would need to be um, earmarked towards a project that is already uh, listed on the, you know, project list for that SPLOS. Sure. Okay, any more questions or comments, commissioners? All right, also, I believe the finance report has been um, presented to the finance committee as well. Finance committee, any comments you have? No, at this time, other than the fact that, you know, we were a little concerned about the splash issue in, in that situation. So I think everything else is, is a go. Thank you, sir. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion for uh, approval of our finance report, please. Motion to approve as presented. Second. Second. Motion second uh, to uh, for the approval of the finance report as of June 30th, 2020, as presented by our finance director, Ms. Mills. <coughs> Further comment, questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The, uh, all who oppose, <laughs> it appears the ayes have it. Therefore, that motion carries. All right, we are item number four. Consider approval of contract of phase one, Magnolia Park, Railway and Utility Improvement. Mr. Gerald Alverson, our city engineer and public works director, will be presenting. Good evening. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. All right, good. Um, as you know, <clears throat> Magnolia Park is a residential neighborhood north of Brunswick High School with um, some very poor failing roads um, as well as storm drainage and um, water utility issues in there. Um, so we went in, we partnered with Joint Water and Sewer and went in and designed improvements for reconstruction of the roadway, um, storm drainage improvements and water utility constructions. Um, we completed the design, put that project out to bid, um, got two bids back, which were significantly higher than our, our budget for the project. Um, so we went back and, and um, some value engineering and, and tried to make this thing more manageable. And um, basically what we've come up with is to construct this thing, build these improvements in phases. Um, the, the idea is that we would go in and start with phase one, which is everything north of Terra Lane. There's a, there's a sketch of the neighborhood attached. It's uh, Pinewood, 
the north half of Woodland Way, um, Formosa, Poinsettia Circle, and Cherry Street. All of those would be included in phase one. Um, the remainder of the subdivision, the south side, Woodland Way, and Peach Street will be phase two, and then Terra Lane and Habersham being phase three. But right now we're, we're focusing on phase one. Um, so we've gone back and um, kind of scaled the project down to so that we're looking at water, I mean, um, storm drainage and roadway improvements in phase one. Um, joint water and sewer is prepared to, const to do the entire neighborhood, to go ahead and do the water improvements throughout the entire neighborhood in all three phases right now. Um, so that, that would, um, that would get that finished and get them out of the way there. But um, we would be working on phase one right now for roadway and storm drainage improvements. Um, the total value of the contract would be $3,965,606. Of that, we would Joint water and sewer would be responsible for about $1.8 million of that. And um, we would sign an intergovernmental agreement with them, which would be a separate agenda item for them to carry that cost. Um, that would leave us with a cost of $2,113,013 for the roadway and storm drainage improvements. Um, Right now we have sufficient funding in our SPLOS account, SPLOS 6 account for roadway improvements and storm drainage improvements to cover the cost of this phase one project. Um, I, I, we've tried to set aside some money for college park improvements. We know those are under design and that work's coming. And also when we talked with the finance committee about this project, um, the big question that came out of there was funding the remainder of the Magnolia Park project, um, phases two and three, and, and how might we fund those? Um, I know Ms. McDuffie's, I've been working with her on some funding projections and some thoughts on how we can do that. And I don't know if she wants to say anything about that right now or, or not. Yes, um, we are looking at several different, um, I guess, funding avenues. And we did talk about the uh, additional SPLOS money, if that may be used for it. Um, I'm going to, let's see if I can share my screen right now. Um, this was kind of some information that we put together. As Gerald said, uh, the project itself would cost about 2.1 million which would leave a remaining SPLOS balance of 1.6 million. Of that, we had already designated 1.4 million for the college part, but um, we are looking at a hazard mitigation, a CDBG grant that the county, um, we're looking at a joint grant with the county for college part. So we may be able to get grant funding for that particular project, which would free up money for Magnolia Park. Um, the Magnolia Park phase two and three is about 2.2 million as it's um, the estimated right now, which right would leave us um, a total of 3.6 million of total project funding that's needed right now, which without the grant would leave us short about right at $2 million. So again, we looked at some pro proposed funding sources our, our LMIG, which went down, which we don't have a clear explanation, but probably because of the lower fuel cost and lower travel, since it's from the fuel tax, the LMIG went down by $40,000 this year, and it's only $191,000. Um, we are looking at hopefully at least a million dollars from the CDBG mitigation grant, but of course it is a grant, it is a competitive process, so that's not necessarily guaranteed. Um, but again, looking at the, the SPLOS funds, hopefully if we get the additional SPLOS funds, if we could use some of that money, then we could make up the pot for funding the other part of Magnolia. Um, 
incidentally, today we got notification of another hazard mitigation grant um, that we will use or we will try to make application for for the Magnolia Park phase two and three. So we're going to look at two different grant pots and try and see what we can get. The first one would be for College Park as a joint grant with the county. And the second one would be for Magnolia Park for phase two and three. And with all of those, we would try and get all these projects finished um, or at least funded by next summer. How much is the uh, notification that you just got? How much is it for, does it say? It's over 600, I think it's $600 million. It's, it's a big, really large, but it's for flood mitigation. So it is direct funding for a project such as Magnolia Park. I feel very strongly that we can put together a really good um, grant package, especially a lot of times when you're applying for federal funds, if you're already uh, shovel ready, you're already committed money to the project, that gives you um, a competitive edge. And uh, I think we'll have a really good competitive project that we can put forth with this, with Magnolia Park to uh, request funding. And, and I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear that because um, when we were in our um, finance committee meeting, I was, I was concerned um, about um, making sure that we can complete the projects that we have talked to the communities about completing and the conditions of, of uh, those communities, the roads, um, uh, et cetera. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, um, that we have some remedies that we are working on so that we can make sure that we, um, we complete what we have, um, have stated to the communities that we're going to um, complete. Um, I had one question too, Gero. You had mentioned that uh, the joint water sewer could go ahead and do all of their improvements throughout all of Magnolia Park, even though the city was not able to do, or, or even though the city was going to have to phase in the actual road work repave. Is, is that not going to create uh, roads being <coughs> up, uh, what's, what would that situation look like? No, ma'am, it, it will. Um, they, there's actually a cost in there. If you look at the spreadsheet of the water system breakdowns, the last section is um, in there is for roadway. There's $202,000 for them to come in and make roadway patches and repairs for, because there will be areas outside of phase one where they install services and they install lines under the road and that kind of thing that they will have to go back and patch because we don't know how quickly we'll be coming behind them. Obviously in phase one, we'll be coming right behind them and rebuilding the road. But in phases two and three, they're gonna have to repair the road so that it'll hold up for a period of time. And that's what that $202,000 is for them to make those repairs. Okay, thank you for that further explanation then. And, and and Julie, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner uh, Martin, that is one of the things that, that I, I stressed myself and Commissioner Williams stressed in our finance committee meeting, um, which is why um, they were going on to uh, inquire about these other fundings and trying to get those things in place because that is a concern um, with the condition that the roads are in and then once uh, joint water and sewer goes in and starts their work or completes their work, then now you're gonna have, you would cause even to, at, my, at my point, uh, even uh, uh, additional problems. So um, that question was posed to Garo, and he did say that um, uh, uh, they would come in and, and do that work to make sure that those ro roads were at least um, in a better condition than, that they, than they are currently in. And I even addressed with him the uh, equipment, the piece of equipment that we brought um, that the city purchased to go in and do patches uh, and things of that sort, um, uh, putting that, making sure that we had that uh, ready to be able to uh, be put into play as well so that we could leave, um, even if we, we can't do the immediate uh, paving as we would in phase one, we would still be able to um, have the roads in, in better condition than they are now. 
So, Garrow, when we spoke earlier today, that's that's what this entailed was the joint water sewer is going to go ahead and do their full scope of work. And then the city would would do theirs in three phases. Right. We'll we'll do phase one. They'll do the entire neighborhood so that when we like we said, there there be ours will be kind of standalone projects. When we come back and we're ready to do phases two and three, we, we won't be waiting on them, but we'll also be completely finished with phase one. So we'll just jump in and do phase two and three. Um, but as soon as we finish phase one here, it's open, it's open to traffic, the drainage will be working and everything. There, there won't be any waiting on phase two and three before phase one is operational, if that, if that makes sense. How long is phase one going to take, Gara? We're looking at about a 12 month project. All right, how about phase two? Probably phase two and three together are a 12 month project as well. Um, you know, if, I, if, I, if you split them up, maybe you're looking at eight months and four months for phase three, but um, I, I think the two of them, if you were to combine them, you're looking at a, another 12 month project. Okay, the, the only other huge comment that I have which I think is, we will all agree is super critical, is how is this whole project going to be communicated to the property owners in Magnolia Park? Because we need to come out on the front end and proactively let them know, whether it's through the NPA, door to door, I don't care how it's done, but they have, they have got to be part of the process so they know and they can anticipate and they they're not going to be surprised and disgruntled i'm sure the you know it, it's not going to be a fun time but i i would rather make sure that we are communicating in every way possible and that that those residents are given a contact point within the city that they can call if they have issues or questions and we need to provide a realistic time frame to them. So that, that's my only other big comment. We, I have, told you agree. we will obviously talk with the NPA and you know Reverend Mutchison kind of heads that up. So we'll be certainly in contact with them and attending their meetings as we get ready to head this up. But we've also talked about going door to door, maybe printing up door hangers and just you know knocking on doors or at least hanging them on the doors with with website info, con phone info, contact info, so that so that they're aware um, of kind of how we're going to stage it, when we might be coming through their area, how, how it might work. Um, we're going to be conscious to, to not go in there and tear up the entire neighborhood at once, the kind of like the Urbana project was. So you've got a neighborhood torn up and then put back in stages. We want to you know, kind of put it back as we go. So, um, let's know. talk about Mansfield Street. We, we don't want a Mansfield Street. Right. I'd rather not talk about Mansfield Street. Yeah, well, <laughs> well we, we need to be aware of it. And uh, to, to do the whole project, if you could do it at one time, Carol, how long would it take you to do it in? We had estimated it was going to be an 18 month project to do the entire neighborhood. And to do it in these phases, you're looking at 24 months. Yeah, so it's going to add, add a little time to do it because, you know, mobilization on each end, contractor moving in and out and that kind of thing. So, how much would it cost us to borrow the money to, to do the project with? Does anybody know? Good question, Commissioner Case. My question, too. We can look at that and see how much it can cost. I'm not sure, you know, based on the interest rates. Uh, uh, you're talking about borrowing, I guess, another $2.5 million, roughly. Roughly. Um, I mean, you've got so some good collateral here, Regina. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's ever had any good collateral, we got it. So, well, I, I would, the good I thing would about like to see us not get in there. This is a heavily traveled neighborhood. And uh, if there's any way we could, could simultaneously with the joint water sewer complete this, I think we would, we would be better off borrowing money and trying to do that. 
Well, we'll look at those options as well. At one of the things that um, with the grants that we're looking at, they would be awarded next summer. So they're a year out, which would put us right on track. But of course, getting an award and then getting um, everything in place would take some time. So we'll look at what the cost of um, borrowing the fund and also if we could pay the money back through the grant process. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think so too. I, I, I agree with you, Commissioner Kaysen, that uh, we can do this with only one business interruption or residential interruption would be great. Uh, go in there and get it done within that period of time, 18 months, get it done. Um, it'd be great. I think that the people probably thank us too as well. I know um, people are beginning to say good things about the L Street, even though we phased that in, um, but they are beginning to, to thank us now for, for getting it done. Uh, so, uh, whatever we can do, uh, Mr. City Manager, to uh, to get that project continually to to move instead of sit, sitting back waiting for for it to get to move would be great. I think for our community, for the citizens. Okay. Um, you know, one one other comment I've got here is that what I don't understand is is why we can't get more people to participate in our projects. I, I don't understand that. We, we've got two, two people participating here. And uh, the more participation you got, the, the more likely you are to have, have a lower cost. I don't know the reason why. So, I, yeah, I don't know. We can't, can't make them bid on it. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. There is an answer, and, and the answer is is to not accept two bids, you know, or work to get the others, and and to find those people out there. We we've got the organization to do that. We keep we keep approving these bids, with to my estimation, with minimum participation, not maximum. We should have maximum participation. Well, I'll look yeah. into that. Um, I, again, I haven't had an opportunity to look at our bid processes or look at our contracting and see, you know, we can look at neighboring communities and see how they, Absolutely. Um, you know, their processes are and see, compare ours. You know, we, we, I don't know how uh, mobile Douglas Electric is, but we've got their uh, uh, shop right over on First Street over there. You can't hardly tell there's a shop over there because it's so, so overgrown. But uh, they have participated here for a long time. Are they completely defunct, Garrow? Do you know? or Douglas Electric? Yeah. We don't need electric. I don't know anything about no, they, it. They, they, they do joint. They do the water and the sewer. And they, they go by the... Uh, nomenclature and name of okay. Douglas Electric. I'm not familiar with them. There was a there was a Douglas Asphalt, but no, I'm, no, they're right over their their materials yards right there where the road is so bad on First Street. <laughs> Sorry, Tommy not Dixon with them. working on that too to try to get them to take care of it over there. Uh, but they've got equipment in there. They've got all kind of PVC pipe in there. You might want to take a look at it. Well, I would be curious to know how many uh, participants there are on, on an RFP through the county when it comes to paving projects and things of that nature. We'll do some research on other areas and the county and other surrounding cities. Because one of the things I know if, is the distance is always a, a concern in terms of how far those construction people have to go and mobilization. So those can push your cost up. So we do want someone who's you know in the area and working with DOT possibly and that kind of thing. So we'll make sure we at least have the vendor list from the county and the DOT to work from. Good. I really believe in, in using local vendors. Uh, it, really, what you do, we're spending SPLOS money, and, and if the folks are local, then you're going to provide more jobs. And, and that's another consideration that we need to be sure when we do this kind of expenditure and this kind of work, are we providing jobs for our people? You know, are, are we doing that? 
That should be answered in, in these, these things. We're spending SPLOS dollars. The people that voted on it very likely could need a job out of, out of uh, this kind of uh, construction. So it's another question to ask. Commissioner Case, and I think that the, the Douglas Electric that you were talking about, I think they're on T Street. No, they're on first. They're on first? Okay. They're on first, okay. yeah, right there where the road's so bad. That's there my, next to the big tower. Okay. All right, are there any further questions from for our, for Mr. Averson? Any comments? Okay, I'm pretty sure this has been run by the, come through the Finance Committee. Finance Committee, any final comments? Well, sir, uh, we, we recommended the break before the full commission. Uh, uh, in light of some of the things that have come out, I don't know, um, you know, if we're going to try to phase it or if we're going to try to do it all at one time. And I don't know if we should allow uh, Ms. McDuffie, maybe defer this item and allow Ms. McDuffie the opportunity to uh, research what it would cost if we borrowed the money to complete the project and to move, move it forward. Well, I, I think I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I agree with the, um, I, I don't want to defer it, but I do agree with that um, because if we can um, come up with another um, way to get the project uh, done um, all at one time, I would be uh, agreeable to that. It would be less strenuous on the community, um, but I think that's something that's worth looking at. Well, I did get some information today from um, the Georgia Infrastructure Transportation Infrastructure Bank. Um, I, and they said that they were going to open up some loans at the end of the year. So um, that may be in a couple of months. And what probably I would suggest going forward definitely with what we have right now and just continuing to get this project, I mean, the second half, so that it could be integrated in without any time um, lapses. I, I could go with that. I mean, just as long as we're we're moving forward with those actions. Okay. I can agree with that also. Yeah, I can agree with that also. If we can, if we can get this project started at the same time and and continue to look for sources or resources to to fund the other two phases and make it all work together, then yeah, let's move forward. Thank you. Any further comments? I'll make a motion that we approve the Magnolia Park Roadway project and uh, that we try to do it all in, in uh, one part along with the joint water sewer in unison with the joint water and sewer to be less interruption to the community. Second. Second. Okay, probably motion second for, for the contract for construction of phase one and with um, the other things that have been mentioned by Commissioner Kaysen uh, and discussed by this whole commission. Are there any further questions or comments? When will the um, communication start going out to the citizens in that community so they'll know when this construction will start and, and what delays they might be facing? We will plan to attend their next um, NPA meeting and then we'll go ahead and start working up a, a door hanger and a flyer and get, getting that printed information out there as well. But we'll try to get that done by the end of August um, and then uh, we'll, we'll plan to attend their next NPA meeting. Have you got an exact start date, Garo, for, for number one? Uh, I think we had about two or three people. Though. Excuse me, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead, Julie. I was just asking if you would please include all of the the mayor and the commission on and the city manager on whatever you're communicating to the NPA and to the residents, so that if and when we get those phone calls, we know what's been communicated. Yes. Thank certainly. you. Certainly. And, and also, Garo. Um, Please make sure that you get with um, Dominique um, as the community um, and neighborhoods director 
so that this can be a concerted effort. Okay. Yeah, I lean on them a lot for, for help getting this information out. Gero, do you have a start date for this project right now, tonight? I think as soon as we can get contracts executed, based on my conversation with the contractor, he's ready to get begin on the water work. That will begin slightly ahead of the storm and roadway work, but he's ready to jump in there and get going on the water work. So you're probably looking at, I don't know, 30 days or so to get these contracts executed, bonds and that kind of thing. And then yeah. uh, give a little time for mobilization and submittals, approvals and that, but um, we want to get moving as soon as possible. So maybe mid-September, mid to latter September? Mid, mid to late September, I would say. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, I, and I just would have one to um, to, to um, uh, let us make sure that we uh, do a, a status update for College Park because we don't want them to feel that um, they're being slighted in any in any way um, and that we are still on track with moving forward what we've discussed with them on their project as well because they've been waiting a long time. Yes, Commissioner Harris, you're right. I can I can tell you real quickly on College Park that the the preliminary design of of installing this channel or new drainage channel in in the right of way alongside the spur has been approved by GDOT. Um, their hydrology side of GDOT has approved it. Um, so now we're going forward with actual putting together the actual construction plans. Um, they are planning to have that completed towards the end of this year. Um, right now, they're looking at some, some ideas to try to minimize any right of way acquisition or any of that that may be needed. So, um, and try to try to value engineer that down as much as we can, but um, on track to have design completed by the end of this year. That sounds good. I appreciate it, Gary. And I think we'll have some good news coming um, out of this meeting as well as we move towards the. Um, on into the agenda towards that CDBGR. Right. Okay. Right. I'm certainly thankful and, and uh, uh, hope that we can get this moving and along with College Park because, you know, I get a lot of those phone calls out of that area. So let's, let's keep that on, on, on the radar. All right. No further comments? Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner Kaysen, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Harris, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Williams, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Martin, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Harvey, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Commissioners. It seems to be that motion carries unanimously. Thank you so very much. All right, moving right along, uh, something that's, that's uh, tied to this previous um, agenda item we just had. Consider approval of the intergovernment agreement with Brunswick Glen Joint Ward and Sewer Commission for Magnolia Park uh, Roadway and Utility Improvement. Mr. Aberson, you presented this to as well. Um, um, go ahead. Yes, sir. This, this is very closely related. Um, as we mentioned of the contract we just approved, about $1.8 million of that will be dedicated to water system improvements and the, and the costs that go along with that. And this is simply an intergovernmental agreement for the Joint Water and Sewer Commission to take on those costs. Um, this is basically the agreement we've used on um, L Street, um, other projects in the past. Um, so it just splits the cost um, and, and gives the portion of the water and sewer improvements directly to Joint Water and Sewer Commission. So um, they will be they will be responsible for the value of that right now is one million eight hundred fifty two thousand five hundred ninety three dollars um, of this contract. Yes, and I think Joint Water and Sewer are ready to go like as you mentioned uh, previously. Uh, any questions? If not, give me a motion, please. 
One question. Uh, yes. Mr. Corey, have you checked this over and made sure that it's all in order? Yes, I've been very involved in getting these contracts together, as has Joint Water and Sewers um, Council. With that, be, with that being said, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to offer a motion that we approve the uh, intergovernmental agreement between the City of Brunswick and Joint Water. Second. Motion second for the approval of the intergovernmental agreement between between Brunswick and the and the Joint Water and Sewer Commission for Magnolia Park. Any further comments, questions? Madam Clerk, call the roll again, please. Commissioner Kaysen? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Mayor Perton Martin? Yes. Mayor Harvey? Yes. Okay, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. If we move right along, com uh, item number six, consider approval of contract amendment with Sindel Wendell construction for construction of the southern segment of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard multi-use trail. Mr. Aberson, you present this again. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, the MLK trail is a um, bike and pedestrian trail that we're working on. It will connect from Prince Street all the way down to Fourth Avenue and then turn and go out and connect to the trail along Highway 17. Um, we recently completed the north segment of that trail between Prince and Third Avenue. Um, Swindell Construction completed that phase of it. Um, so now this is the phase between Third Avenue and Fourth Avenue. Um, and then that will leave one final phase along Fourth Avenue, which we're working on GDOT permit on that but um, this will get us from 3rd Avenue all the way down to the 4th Avenue right of way. Um, we put this out for bid. Um, we got three bids back on this one. Um, lowest bid was from Swindell Construction, $134,975. Um, as I mentioned, they completed the north segment of this and um, we have not officially closed out that contract yet. Um, so since that's not closed out, we were just gonna tack this on as a contract amendment to their contract and um, keep, on, keep on going. Um, and they're ready to go as soon as possible. Um, this work or this trail, this project is being funded by from SPLOS 6 trails money. Um, we also received a $100,000 grant from the Department of Natural Resources Recreation Trails Program. Um, of that $100,000, we've already been reimbursed for $75,000 of it, and we will we'll receive the additional $25,000 on completion of the entire project of that section along 17 or Fourth Avenue, which we plan to have completed by the end of this year. But um, so um, we're asking for approval of this contract amendment for $134,975 to continue construction of the MLK trail. Okay. Uh, commissioner's comments? Uh, the only comment I have is I've had several people contact me specifically about uh, the our progress with uh, bicycle and pedestrian trail, uh, especially from Liberty Ship Park all the way to Gloucester and Overlook Park. And I just wanted to share that with full commission that's been very nicely uh, received and people are very excited about that. So. I'm glad to see the continuation of this uh, safe routes to school, but you know, dovetailed in with our, our full multi-use trail system. Aaron, have they already put some uh, concrete out there? Yes, sir. He is, I, I um, thought I'd seen some pouring. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, he was anxious to get some work for his crews. I explained to him that this still had to be approved by the commission, so he was willing to take that chance. So, yes, sir, he did. So, 
Okay, has this been run by the finance committee? And finance uh, committee, any comment? Now, we didn't have any problem, Mr. Mayor. We we knew that uh, these money were in our budget and that we were moving these bills forward. So uh, I think that yes, we're sir. Okay. on the right path. We're getting some things done in the city. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your approval of that. Um, Commissioners, is it, there no other further comments? I entertain a motion, please. I'll make, I'll make a motion that we approve the MLK Boulevard multi-use trail contract amendment for the southern section of construction with uh, Swindell Construction in the amount of $134,975. Second. Okay, my property motion second for the approval of the southern section of Martin Luther King Boulevard um, multi-use trail by Swindell Construction. Any further comments? A question. I must say I'm very happy about it because I have of late been putting uh, that trail at usage. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, enjoying I it. I have one comment. Uh, the comment then is it uh, Garris to you about um, how a coffin park improvement. I know we have money in our splash account for that and we got a track that goes around coffin park that looks terrible. Um, uh, are there any, are we going to get to that eventually? We, we are. Um, yes, we've got a couple of things in the works at Howard Coffin <laughs> Park. One thing, one thing we had, we've got a, a grant for a playground and pavilion improvements there, which we kind of put on hold waiting on the baseball stadium to play out. But um, we'll see if pick that back up. You seem to have played out. Okay, so we'll, we'll pick up that grant and get that back moving, but um, and then we'll run some numbers and see what kind of funds are there to work on trail improvements. And um, I know that trail does need some work over there, so we'll it see what we can work. As a matter of fact, that's when I get better, basically, too, as well. Um, and we have $232,000 in our splash account to work on that. I don't think we've done anything at Coffin Park much uh, this year or without splash dollars uh, with that. So um, we need to do something about that. Anyhow, that's my comment uh, concerning trails and something that Howell Coffin Park. Okay. Any further comment? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, those opposed have the same sign. It um, appears the eyes have it. I have one quick question. I'm sorry. It was on, I had a comment on my very last page and didn't see it till I flipped over. Um, Garo, are there other plans for further beautification of that trail on, on the backside? Um, we don't have anything down yet. Um, you know, we were kind of looking down there the other day. I think it's a nice area for a little park. Um, or something down there, maybe a little sitting area with some benches or something like that. I think we can certainly look at. We haven't put anything, any kind of design on paper yet or anything. Okay, well, I would uh, suggest maybe that we get in touch with either the, and I'm happy to initiate it, the uh, gifts of the, the tree folks, and then also uh, keep Brunswick or keep Golden Isles beautiful um, when they have donations of trees and are looking for a place to put them. Certainly. Yeah, let's, let's talk with them and it'd be a great place for it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, that motion carries unanimously. Okay. Item number seven, moving right along. Consider approval of contract amendment with wood environmental and, and infrastructure solutions for construction administration of T Street Landfill. Mr. Apperson, you present it again. Great, this is my final item here. Um, as you know, with the T Street Landfill, um, we had the closure, landfill closure um, design, we thought completed um, by TRC Environmental Consultants. Um, actually put it out to bid, got bids back, and we're beginning construction on that when um, came to our attention that there were some issues with the EPD jurisdictional line, we learned that there was some waste 
located below that line. Um, and in kind of researching that, we learned that there were some other design issues that were that were not attended to that that probably should have been by the original designer. So um, in sorting all this out with um, EPD, the group, the ownership group, which is us, this is the city, um, Georgia Pacific and Hercules um, brought wood environmental consultants on board um, to try to try to sort this out with EPD and kind of help us get back on track. Um, they have a, a very good relationship with EPD. So, um, and we're able to get us through that hurdle, but um, in light of the other design, I guess misses you would say by the original designer, um, the group has elected to keep wood on board and going forward with wood for construction administration and oversight of the landfill as we get back into construction, um, construction reporting and compliance with EPD regulations and that kind of thing. So this is a contract with um, our contract amendment with Wood Environmental to for those costs for construction administration going forward. Um, it is a, the value of this contract amendment is $290,000. $390. Um, this amount will be paid from the escrow account. We all, all three ownership groups contribute equally to an escrow account. Um, right now there's um, about $3.28 million in that escrow account. Um, we are, Wood is looking at some items, some alternative fill. Um, we're hopeful to get this landfill built and including this um, contract amendment without having to make an additional contribution to that escrow account. We're hoping that $3.2 million will get us through. Um, if it turns out that we do have to make an additional contribution, I think in the finance report, Ms. Mills mentioned there's about $150,000 we have had budgeted last year that was setting aside if we need to make that contribution, an additional contribution to the, to the escrow account. But, um, so this, this contract amendment is just for Woods contract administration, construction administration services during construction of the landfill closure. Um, the other two groups, Georgia Pacific and Hercules have both approved this, um, this contract amendment. So um, we're the we're the third third group to review it. So, Darrow, I am a little confused, as, as sometimes I often am. TRC Environmental Corporation did the original design, correct? The original closure design. That's right. So, my question is, would there be any thought that there was negligence on their part based on what they designed and and then the awarding of the construction bids to Lone Wolf Resources, where does that leave them in that contract situation that was awarded in August of last year and um, in being able to switch over to Wood Environmental for construction admin. As far as TRC goes, we had had an agreement with them um, for this construction admin as well. Um, yes, I think the group, first answer your question, the group did feel like there was some negligence or some, and certainly some lack of responsiveness with EPD as we got into this issue, but um, certainly the oversight of several things and, and some negligence there in the design, um, some things that should have been addressed that were not um, kind of kind of put a bad taste in the group's mouth around TRC. So um, we canceled the contract with them, terminated that agreement. There was about $200,000 left on that agreement. So um, that's, you know, 200,000 that we had already kind of budgeted, if you will, to pay them that we're not having to pay now. 
So, um, but as far as Lone Wolf, the contractor goes, um, they are kind of kind of on hold. They're still continuing their erosion control um, duties out there and trying to keep all of that up to speed right now. Um, they've still been involved in kind of getting over this hurdle and means and methods of getting the debris out of the marsh and kind of trying to be compliant with EPD's orders there and, and the best way to remove that fill material. Um, they are working also with wood to kind of pricing out some alternative fill materials from the mill, um, which would be a significant cost savings as opposed to having to bring in some imported fill material from, a, from another source. So um, Lone Wolf is definitely still in the picture. Um, and I think probably would go, we'll go forward with Lone Wolf as the contractor, you know, once we get, get over this hurdle. So was our, our, our termination of a relationship with TRC Environmental Corp, uh, or, or have we been harmed at all? Have we, we lost out something? Is there anything that we need to be concerned about with that? No, ma'am, we had all, we had, paid them for the services that they had performed, but, but nothing else. And so it's kind of, we were paying them as, as you go kind of thing. Um, so it, we, it was a clean break. No, um, you know, I, I think they, they understood the, the situation and kind of, they didn't seem to question it. So I, I don't think there's any harm done at all there. Okay. I have one comment on this particular contract and I made it during the finance committee meeting because it was of concern. They have a lot of costs associated with their travel, their um, hours for meetings and things like that. I, I wanted to just be on record saying that, you know, those type things we definitely um, in the future need to look more closely at. I was reluctant to stop the train at this point because if the other two parties have already approved this, and of course time is of the essence in terms of getting things under control and getting the corrective action plan completed. Um, but there are some you know, extraneous costs, I think that we certainly, in my opinion, Woods is in Kennesaw, but they have you know, over $40,000 of hotel, air, meals, travel, fees that's associated with the contract. And I know looking, you know, to the future, we certainly need to keep an eye on things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, Amen. A, a cap or a not to exceed or something. That's, I and and that, I think that's how this is written. This is sort of the, the numbers they have in there are a not to exceed. So, I, you know, I think, again, this will be kind of a pay as we go, but, but Ms. McDuffie's right. We can look, look at those numbers, but you know, I don't know that hopefully we won't get to that $40,000 in travel, you know, maybe we can minimize their travel and hopefully try to keep those numbers down as we go through this. I mean, is there any way to substantiate what they've claimed as, um, search, you know, travel and uh, hotel? It is know. itemized in the information that they gave us. I mean, it is itemized to, you know, a level of hours and and we will what we can do is just make sure that that is minimized as much as possible and we will you know i will i guess work to sit down at the table and make sure that what we're paying um is what we need to pay at this point thank thank you for bringing that to our attention well i would hope i i wouldn't want it to go by and you know come back and say why didn't we look at this or why didn't we at least you know, acknowledge that we were paying all of these fees. And and that is that is something that um that that uh Miss McDuffie thoroughly addressed with us in our finance committee meeting. Um and henceforth you will definitely know that um those things will be uh, even the more closely scrutinized. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what 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 say you, Mr. City Attorney? We discussed this in, in finance and I kind of, I mean, I agree definitely with the, the city manager, but 
what Gara has laid out is the process that kind of took place, and the group is all sort of in agreement that this is something that we need to move forward with. And I have a, we have another amendment that's related to the the T Street that's coming up in a in a moment, but okay. um, I do think it's something that we need to move forward with. Okay. And and that is and that is what um, all of us um, discussed and 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 what um, Regina so um, so eloquently brought out in our meeting um, is that um, going forward we know. Now, again, as I said, these things will be more scrutinized, but because of where we are now in the process, um, we want to uh, move, we do recommend moving forward. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say too, Mr. Mayor, that I think that as a city, um, with all the hotels and, and hotelers that we have around, that we may be able to say, okay, you know, the city of Brunswick recommends that you stay at, you know, and we know those rates. So, they don't go stay at Sea Palms or somewhere else where we're getting these outlandish rates. Yes. Now, now I don't know. I don't know if we can recommend any place because um, we don't want to get caught up in that. But we can we can give per diem amounts or caps, as Regina has said. Well, there's something we can do, and I'm sure we are we're on it too, and we're going to be monitoring that. So that's a good thing right there. So we'll be on top of that. There's a name that uh, is in this thing that has been CC'd to that is uh, Wood. It's uh, Leonard Ledbetter. Is that a familiar name to anybody? He is a former director of Georgia EPD. I, I mean, I don't know him personally. I, I just know that. And that was one of the reasons for, for Wood's um, you know, attractiveness originally was his relationship and, and getting through this hurdle with EPD. Uh-huh. All right. Thank you. Okay, any further comments or questions? Okay, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been approved through our finance committee as well. Finance committee has made their comments. Uh, so I entertain a motion if there are no further comments, commissioners. May I like to offer a motion to approve the contract amendment with Woods Environmental and Infrastructure and Infrastructure Solutions for the construction amendment to T Street Landfill. Second. Is there a proper motion to second to uh, for approval of the contract amendment with Wood Environmental and Infrastructure Solutions for construction and administration of T Street Landfill? For the any further further discussion or comments? Hearing uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And I opposed have the same right. It seems the eyes have it. Thank you. That motion is approved. All right, we're down to city attorney items. Uh, item number eight is approval of, of an amendment to the T Street Landfill Escrow Amendment. Uh, Mr. City Attorney. Mr. Brian Corey. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, what you have before you is this is, again, this is dealing with the same group um, for the T Street landfill, uh, Ashland, Georgia Pacific, and the city of Brunswick. Um, originally, when we started this process, uh, when we created the escrow account, we entered into it an escrow agreement with those two entities um, to use, there was two components to this. There was going to be and attorney, uh, it would be King and Spalding out of Atlanta. They were helping create the escrow account, manage it, and hold it. And then there was DeMaximus, um, is the accounting firm that monitored and checked, sort of went back and checked all the math. You know, where they were accounting, checking all the, the escrow amounts and, and submitting invoices and, and those types of things. Um, after moving through the process, since we've been approved and we are now about to go through the actual construction phase and, and, and clean this landfill up. Um, we were actually approached by King and Spalding, the attorneys that were doing the work on this. Uh, and they voluntarily sort of said, we don't think we need to be involved anymore. We've created the account. Uh, DeMaximus can do the job as escrow agent. Uh, as long as the parties are all okay with it, 
we can sort of back out of this agreement and then we can save you guys some money. Um, so everybody, I had several conference calls with both parties, um, Ashland and Hercules, I'm sorry, and Georgia Pacific, uh, and their legal counsel. We all agreed that this would be the better solution um, because it would just, it removes another uh, party from this process of getting things approved um, and it would save us some money in the end. So what you have before you is an amendment to the escrow agreement. Originally, King and Spalding, as an attorney, as the law office was named as our escrow agent, this amendment would now remove them as escrow uh, agent and name De Maximus Incorporated as the escrow agent. Um, it would, it's going to follow the exact same process, except for instead of originating from King and Spalding, it will now originate from De Maximus. So De Maximus will still present all invoices to the group, meaning the city of Brunswick, um, Ashland and Georgia Pacific, we'd have 14 days to review and uh, either object or, you know, approve, which is essentially no action is approving. And then they can, they can process the invoice for payment. So it really is just simplifying the process that we had. Uh, King and Spalding served a need at the beginning of this as the escrow agent, but that need is sort of expired and they've, you know, rather than I think the last, you know, the invoices for them were, were coming in, they were doing very little work and, um, it was just not necessary anymore. Okay. Comments? I don't uh, see them specifically mentioned in this escrow agreement, though. Who's that? King and Spalding? Either King and Sp Spalding or uh, this new firm that you're talking about. It is. Um, the Maximus is in the second line. It's, second line. For whatever reason, the way that they spell their name, everything is lowercase. That oh. is how they want it. So if you look at the second line of the agreement. Yes, thank okay. you. Totally, totally got lost. Okay, right. thank you. That is how they want their name spelled. That's how it's legally spelled. That's how it's in all the other agreements. Um, King and Spalding is being removed. They, the agreement, the way that they, everybody wanted to amend this agreement is it just, it's almost like an ordinance amendment. It just shows where the changes would be. So the former, um, if you look down under the now, therefore, uh, number one, the agreement is hereby amended by deleting section four of the agreement in its entirety. In that section four, the previous section four had King and Spalding as the escrow agent. So this new amendment is naming the Maximus as the escrow agent and changing that language to say that as escrow agent, they now hold these duties, submitting the invoice to the parties for review, the 14 days, and then if no objections are received, uh, they're authorized to disperse the funds from the escrow account. Okay, and thank I, you. I, I don't know if they were a Tennessee court, but I totally passed over where their name was written. Sorry about that. So, Corey, I'm looking, and, and I guess this is um, that first whereas, I guess that's 2015, is that what that's supposed to be? Yes, that was the original escrow agreement, it was in 2015. Okay, I just, I just, you know, there's a lot of space between those, those numbers. Oh, I noticed that. Just I'm looking at the word version that I had. I did notice online for whatever reason it spaced it way out. Yeah. That is not how it reads in Word. I think that was just sort of a, a lost in in translation. <laughs> yeah, it's not supposed to read like that. Sorry. Um, let me pull it up to make sure online is right. Yes, so that would be 2015, and then the second line, that is July 10th. That is, uh, you also see where, for whatever reason, when it was, I guess when it was near a number, it just spaced like crazy, but 14 days, and I think that's all. Okay. Any comments, further comments, commissioners? I'll make a motion that we approve the amendment to the escrow agreement and remove King and Spalding. Second. It's been probably motion and second to approve of the amendment to the T Street Landfill escrow amend agreement. Um, any further comments? Hearing now, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed at the same same right. It appears the eyes have it. Thank you.
Commissioner, that that item um, is approved. All right, item number nine, consider approval of City of Brunswick order requiring face covering or masks in public places. Uh, Mr. City Attorney item. Yeah, you stay here. Back up. Um, what you have before you is something that was briefly discussed at the last city commission meeting. Yes, sir. The draft order before you is based uh, primarily upon language from Savannah's, Atlanta's, Athens, and there's one other, uh -huh. uh, I've had all that memorized, but this is how it was drafted. And I have sent out, I think I've given some emails out. Um, the way these orders were drafted were obviously, all of the orders I just named obviously were, were presented and approved uh, prior to uh, Governor Kemp's most recent executive order. I think everybody is aware of the language in the most recent executive order regarding mandates for face coverings. Um, I mentioned that in the email I sent out. So I, if everyone reviews, I know there was a couple comments um, earlier today from Commissioner Martin and the mayor. Um, I had a comment from Commissioner Kaysen early in the process of drafting this. Um, and I just wanted to hear if there's discussion again. I think that the um, rev suggested revisions by Commissioner Martin would probably be wise, uh, you know, to remove one of the, I think, suggested revisions was removing sort of the punitive measure. Um, and then the mayor had even made some um, p potential suggestions about the language of whether it was mandating, requiring, but um, I'd leave it up to the discussion of the board and and see where you guys would like to go from here. Okay, we all gonna want to speak at one time. Comments? <laughs> well, I, I read, um, I did read it, and um, and I, I didn't send any comments because I agreed with um, uh, some of the uh, 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 revisions that uh, Commissioner Martin made. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. I'm, I'm good with it. Um, I just, you know, I, I hope this is not one of those things that we put on, on, on books that we don't enforce or we don't maintain once we get it enforced. I, I don't feel that we as a commission would be enforcing it per se. I feel that our, our community has been very good about that. And I think especially our, our business owners and folks that have uh, the public coming in and out of their locations. But I, I do think it's important that, that they continue to be vigilant about putting signage in a window or on the door as people come in, please wear your mask, you know, masks required, however they wanna, they wanna term it. Um, and that they have free masks available, I mean, in case somebody's left it in their car or they left it at home or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, that, we, that we do that. But that back office personnel, if they're not directly interfacing and interacting face-to-face -face with, with the public, I would let the business owners determine what their protocol is going to be and what what their uh, their employees desire as far as as what that protocol might look like um i think those were my my biggest concerns was that it and then uh, too you know as the mayor stated that it not be mandatory but very strongly suggested that people wear their masks but i don't think we need to be punitive in uh, in trying to spend the time of our police force or others to to find people and go through the courts and that sort of thing. And that that's what I was saying. You know, it, at at some point, if you don't enforce it, it won't. You know, people will just take it for granted. And that you know, we have here on like paragraph number five says the person who fails to comply with paragraph one this order shall be guilty of a civic infraction punishable by a fine of not more than $500 pursuant to, you know, to the law. So if, if we're not going to enforce it, I mean, if we're just strongly suggesting why we got all this other language in here, that's not going to be adhered. 
Well, well see, me, that's, that's, what, that's what Commissioner Martin, those were her suggestions, is that the punitive part be removed. Because my question to you, uh, Commissioner Harris, and I understand what you're saying, but my question would be, how do you see that playing out in a retail establishment where a customer has come in and does not have a mask on? Well, I, um, I don't think that it needs to be punitive, um, but I think that what we're doing will support what the um, establishment, the entrepreneur, the owner wants to do. Um, and that's in, like you said, posting the notices on the door, um, uh, giving them that support to know that the, the city is, is strongly encouraging that as well. Post it on the door. Um, we strongly suggest that we strongly support that. Um, and I just lost my train of thought just like that. <laughs> Well, I do think if, if Commissioner Harris, do you mind if I chime in? It went somewhere. I don't know where it went. Go ahead. Right. I do think that if it's kind of one or you know, give or take. So obviously, if a if a uh, merchant downtown requires it, that is their their right, their prerogative right. to right. to do that. And you know, they can obviously state that, hey, the city is also supporting my right to require you to come into my um, establishment wearing a mask. Uh, and to everybody's point that's talking about this tonight, if if we were to remove the punitive measures, I think it would be only sensical to make it a strongly encouraging message from the city to state we're strongly encouraging. You know, again, I think the governor's order also, even though it prohibits us from doing it, it strongly encourages um, the, the wearing of face masks. So if we were to mirror that language and remove the punitive measure, I think it does have to go hand in hand. You can't have a mandate without punitive, and I don't think you should have punitive if you're just strongly suggesting it. I think that if you wanted to do the strongly encouraging, it would support any merchant downtown, any anyone, in, not downtown, in the entire city, um, from being able to utilize and protect you know, their business and their the people that are, you know, their patrons, so. Because, because, I, because it's, it's their right. Um, this is this is not just for the Patreon's protection. It's for the the business's protection. It's for their owner's protection. I mean, it, to, to, for them to be able to exercise their right to say, listen, um, we are requiring face masks in this business. If you want to come to the, into this establishment, these are our requirements. That's just like um, when you're going out um, and and they require you to have on a shirt before you can, you can't just come in there bare chested. Um, okay, so you can't come in here without a mask. What's the difference? You can't come uh, in my um, establishment without a, without a shirt on. So it still, it still puts it in the hands of the entrepreneur, of the business owner to determine um, what they feel is best for for their business, um, so that that's that's how I feel about it. Um, it, it still allows them uh, that level of control to determine um, what safety precautions they are going to um, put into place. Commissioner, Wade. I feel I feel they should go in with the mask if they're going to be inside. Um, within six uh, feet of each other, uh, the waiter, the waitress, a waiter is coming to the table. People are sitting at the table. Um, so I, I believe in all of those measures being exercised. I, I agree with you, Commissioner Harris, because you know, even though people say, "Well, uh, the funeral home is a public place," but we don't allow anyone, and I do mean anyone, not even staff to come into that building without a mask on. Um, but if, let's say if Joe Blow comes and says, well, I, I'm not coming, I, I'm coming in, but I'm not gonna put on a mask. Then when it comes to, to the law, you know, how do we enforce that? Do we call the police and say, okay, I've got Joe who won't put on a mask and then, you know, he's fine. Well, you, it's your business. Social distance that has to be adhered to, if nothing else. 
Say, say that again, Commissioner. I didn't hear. Uh, I'm just saying that social distancing, if nothing, if nothing else, at a minimum, would have to be adhered to. That is true. I mean, he's endangering you, your employees, whomever, and yes. it, it, it's your right. If you feel that's just like if you if if you feel somebody is coming coming in that business that's a threat to your business. What are you going to do? Right. Commissioner Kaysen, your comment, sir? I already commented. I gave you what I thought at okay. our last meeting, and it got completely mandated for some reason. OK, I, well, thank you for, for your comment. I mean, no, no question that you cannot put something in place that you can't enforce, and there's no way you can enforce this thing. Well, thank you for your comment. Also, I'll just I'll just say um, I, I did uh, provide comments to everybody to to back to uh, Mr. Corey, our city attorney, uh, and uh, I did suggest strongly encourage strongly uh, whatever to that we will wear our masks. And the reason why I did I, I came off my mandate uh, because. Uh, we really anticipate, I anticipate that the governor was going to allow local control, local people to go ahead and decide what happened in the community, and he did not. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, you and I, we all have been watching what's happening with the, the COVID, um, uh, the numbers from the Department of Health, Public Health, uh, and we have seen some of our numbers go down, and mainly because a lot of our businesses have adhered to uh, um, to having people wear masks. And as, as previously stated, a number of businesses have, have uh, I said that unless you want to come in our business, our establishment, you must wear a ma mask. And a lot of the people in the community, business in the community, such as the big box stores are requiring that too. And they are also, if you come in, they give you a mask if you don't have one. So therefore, uh, uh, lately, uh, the businesses have been complying more so in our community. That, that really gives us uh, some, uh, makes us feel good because they too are worried about what's happening in our community and the businesses are complying uh, and taking it to another level without us having to be heavy handed on anybody. So I feel that, that we can uh, continue with strongly suggest even the county suggested as well with a resolution they put out. Uh, so, and that would be in lockstep with the county. So our whole community would be covered in suggesting that we want you to really strongly encourage you to wear your mask. And also the business um, business establishment are able to, to decide for themselves. In other words, they have responsibility and they are, they are really stepping up to the responsibility of, of of uh, making sure that something uh, uh, social distancing and masking in their establishment. Um, people are right. It would have been hard to enforce. Uh, and we, we kind of know that there's been some other ordinance that we had a hard time enforcing as well. During this period of time, we want to be a positive influence on our community and not necessarily one to always try to punish people, so, so to speak. So <clears throat> I feel just like I think a number of you all feel too as well that we can strongly suggest that the wearing of masks in our community and reserve the right if we see that this uh, spike is getting worse or our trend is getting worse, worse, we reserve the right to come back and maybe put a, uh, a mandate of, of enforcing the uh, wearing, wearing a mask. <clears throat> so I hope uh, we've about, we've talked this enough. Um, uh, some people will be happy with it and some will not. Uh, however, uh, we are where we are, and um, with all you all's um, um, input, I've asked uh, the city attorney to redraft um, this ordinance or this, um, I think it would be a resolution right about now, or order, uh, that we would strongly encourage uh, people to continue to wear masks, especially in public places, uh, and face-to-face um, -face, uh, contact with everybody, and do social distancing and washing the hands and so forth like that. So, so uh, any other comment before I close out this matter? 
uh, where does that put us in moving this forward with the revisions that we discussed? Mr. Corey. Think, yes, sir. I think if it was all right with everybody, I'd like to revise it as a resolution. Um, and I would like to, to take a stab in, in taking into tonight's consideration into uh, account. Um, I think if it's clear that we're going to do a strongly incur a resolution strongly encouraging face masks, removing that sort of punitive punitive measures, um, that I can have a resolution. I mean, I can have a draft back tomorrow, uh, and you know, pending. I mean, we could either bring it back at a special call meeting or bring it back at the second weekend in August. Or if you were comfortable in the discussion tonight, uh, in the stating that it would be subject to city attorney revisions, um, you know, you could approve moving forward with a resolution strongly encouraging the use of face masks. It would be very similar in nature to what uh, you had, except for obviously removing any sort of mandates or requirements and removing that uh, civil infraction language in the language discussing whether someone's found to be in violation. There would obviously be no violation of a resolution. Okay, I also put in there about we reserve the right to that we can um, bring it back, uh, make it mandatory if, if need be. Okay. So, I mean, I would be comfortable with that. Um, if the rest of the commission is in just asking that based on tonight's conversation and, and what was put forth to you uh, and everyone else in emails, um, that if those revisions were made to the draft, since it's it's really a, a resolution and not a mandate that we could go ahead and approve that with those changes. And, and I would I would even say um, uh, to piggyback on what the mayor said was we reserve the right um, based upon I mean whatever the uh, health conditions are or something to that effect. Yes. Yeah, right, as the trend, as the data trends, is that what? Yeah, as, it, as, yeah. yes. To how how conditions or, or whatever change, then we reserve the right to come back and, and and take another look at it. I mean, if 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 some if if cases spike or if something changes yes. from where we are now and and it's it's not looking good, then we reserve that right to come back. I mean, I mean, because it's I mean, we're looking out for the health of the community, something to that effect. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. I can do that. I think if, if that is the will of the commission, it would be best to have a motion and, of course, a vote if, if that's where you guys want to go. All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve uh, as, as an ordinance, or excuse right. me, as a resolution, uh, the requiring of face coverings or masks worn in public in the city um per the revisions that we have discussed in not making it punitive etc um, with the option to continually evaluate the the current health risks and making modifications to the resolution as needed okay. Thank you. and just okay and just to be clear that it would not be a requirement now it would be a strongly a resolution strongly encouraging the use yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just reading from, from the- uh, Right, I, I understood. Yeah, thank you. That's very well put though, Julie. I like how you put it. <laughs> so, thank you, Mayor. Anyhow, um, we had a motion and we had a second. Uh, I'm not gonna try to restate everything she said, uh, but I'm pretty sure you all know, and the fact is that our um, city attorney knows um, are there any further discussion? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say essentially what we're doing is redoing what we did at our last meeting. And I don't understand how we got off track from there. We essentially agreed to do what we essentially are agreeing to do tonight, last time. No. So, well, we are. No. And uh, no. yes, we are. We, we are. And uh, we, we need to stop doing that. We, we agreed that, that the statement that we sent out that you read is what we would adopt and it got changed somewhere. Somewhere it got changed. And if you look at the minutes, you see that it didn't say that. Uh, however, we'll move right along. Uh, any further comments? 
Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Commissioner Kaysen? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Mayor Perton Martin? Yes. Mayor Harvey? Yes, that motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you everybody for, for that. We'll move right along. Uh, item number 10, consider for discussion an amendment to the city of Brunswick Code of Orders regarding animal control. Um, Mr. City Attorney? Yes, that is me again. Yes, sir. Um, this, this originated from a, obviously there had been a lot of discussion about a tethering ordinance about a year and a half ago. Um, the county has also looked into a tethering ordinance and has passed one recently. Um, they, in discussing it with me, we still have animal control cases come through municipal court. Um, and I've still obviously been in contact with the, the county attorney's office and they said, hey, you know, we've passed the tethering ordinance. The animal control ordinance for the city probably needs one as well. And I said, yes, this is something that the commission has discussed in the past. So I you know, took a look at theirs. Um, and as I was incorporating it into the animal control ordinance for the city, I realized that back in 2012, I believe, um, the state of Georgia passed what was called the Responsible Dog Ownership Law. Uh, and that placed new requirements on cities and counties to adopt animal control ordinances that accounted for dangerous and vicious dogs. The county did theirs in 2012 or 2013. I cannot require, I cannot um, remember exactly when that took place. However, um, I noticed that the city had not done one. I said, okay, well, if we're cracking open the animal control ordinance now for the tethering um, amendment, we should go ahead and, and bring ours up to date with the, the state law. Um, so that's why there is sort of a comprehensive amendment before you tonight that includes, it includes tethering and there is an animal control officer from the county, Tiffany Hill, she's on the call tonight. Um, she made a presentation to the county board of commissioners with regard to the tethering ordinance. So there is, the tethering ordinance is included in this amendment. Um, if you look down on page, it is a new section on page, I do have page numbers, yes, 10 and 11. She, um, if it's okay with everyone, she'd like to speak to the city commission tonight and kind of talk about that. Um, but the preceding changes that you see on pages uh, one through nine, those are all changes that are required by state law to be included in our city's animal control chapter. Does that, does that all make sense? <laughs> I hope it does. Yes, sir. Okay. She, um, I, yeah, I think Kyle, um, he's adding she, Tiffany. There she is. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for inviting me this evening. Tiffany, I'm going to turn it over to you if that's okay. If, if you were able to hear my introduction. Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, I am... Um, Glad to hear about the adding of the dangerous and vicious dog wording um, potentially into your ordinance. Um, right now, there actually is a situation that we are dealing with within the city with a dog that is highly dangerous that I would like to um, declare so that there are very strict parameters around that dog can be owned if the owner chooses to reclaim, which he um, to date says that he would like to do. So that's very exciting. Um, my presentation this evening is about the amendment uh, proposition for the humane tethering. And that is something that we did pass at the county a couple of months ago. Um, and it is something that honestly, more than once a week, we receive calls about within city limits um, relating to how dogs are um, tethered or chained or housed or not housed um, in the residences within the city. Um, I'm trying to see if I can show you my presentation, but I don't see the option to share my screen. It may just be the host that can do that. I don't know.
All right, thank you. It looked like we had a little bit of de technical difficulty there. Um, so I'd like to propose a humane tethering ordinance to you. This was um, co-drafted by our senior animal control officer, Gerald Ruiz and myself. Um, and it is something that um, we feel is very important to helping us to continue to improve the lives of both the humans and the animals uh, within the city. Um, just to kind of give you an overview of tethering ordinances in Georgia, as you can see, over 50% of Georgia residents live in communities that do have some sort of tethering restriction. So this is something that um, thankfully is not new here in the state of Georgia. Um, our proposed ordinance for the, or ordinance amendment for the city of Brunswick is a humane tethering ordinance. So just to give a definition, tether or tethering means to restrain an animal by tying the animal to any inanimate object or structure. This does not in any way impact uh, dogs or cats who are being walked on a leash or my rabbits actually walk on leash as well. So this has nothing to do with people taking their animals out for a walk and having them on a leash. This is has to do with animals who um, live in people's yards and whose primary method of being kept in that yard is through the use of tethering. Um, this proposed ordinance amendment would ban the use of heavy chains. So that would be any type of chain or rope that was greater than 10% of the dog's body weight. It also bans dogs from being chained on vacant or abandoned properties. Unfortunately, we very frequently frequently respond to calls within the city of people who have moved away and have left their animals uh, chained up in the backyard of the property that they've vacated. It also mandates that there's a minimum tether length of six feet or more and that the tether is clear of entanglement. So it can't be wrapped around a pole or a tree. Um, it's not such that um, if an animal were to try to jump off of a porch that um, they or over a fence that they would not be able to reach the ground and they would then be hung by the tether. Um, it also mandates proper fitting collars and that those collars are not prong collars, pinch collars, or choke collars. And it also mandates easy access to shelter, food, and water. Why consider this ordinance? Um, number one, it provides certain consistent and enforceable minimum care standards for us. Right now, um, we often do get into discussions with residents as to whether or not they are meeting minimum standards of care. And this ordinance amendment would give us more ground to stand on in those discussions. It also gives the police department and my animal control officers the opportunity to educate the dog owners on proper care of their dogs. It reduces neighbor complaints because dogs who are tethered, um, especially those who are tethered 24 hours a day, tend to do more constant barking. Um, they tend to get loose and run loose in the neighborhood and um, other undesirable behaviors. It also reduces a public safety threat. One thing um, that studies have shown with chained dogs is they are more likely to be aggressive because they become more territorial and they also become very frustrated with their living conditions. So we do respond to calls where um, children or neighbors or even owners go out to their dogs that are chained and their dogs do um, act in an aggressive manner toward them. So tethered dogs in the community, just to give you some statistics and examples here, both of these photos here are um, from actual cases. Um, studies have shown nationally that 2.8, uh, tethered dogs are 2.8 times more likely to bite an adult, and they are 5.4 times more likely to bite a child. And this is because they usually have little to no socialization. Um, the dogs who are tethered often become victims themselves of stray dogs who are loose and go into their yard and attack them and they have no way to escape the danger. And a statistic from 2017 State Farm Insurance reported nationally over 3,000 dog related injury claims totaling more than $132 million um, in payouts. And these were just in the ones that were related to dogs who were chained or tethered in yards. You can see in the top photo there, unfortunately, a dog who was um, 
chained with a chain that not only is um, too large for the dog, but uh, as far as diameter, but also apparently was put on the dog when the dog was a smaller size and not adjusted as the dog grew larger. Um, the dog at the bottom, a gorgeous golden retriever male. Um, he actually is from a case outside of Glen County. However, um, he was for his entire life from the time that he was a puppy chained to that tree. Um, and now his owners no longer want him and they want to rehome him. However, all of the rescue groups and shelters who have been attempting to rehome him have not been able to find a home for him because he does act aggressively because he has no socialization whatsoever. So the couple are of cases that are- pictures we see? Uh, yes. Um, are you able to see the PowerPoint presentation? No. No. We're not seeing the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I thought that my screen had been shared by IT. Well, I think you might have been given a copy of the presentation. If you haven't, um, I'll work with Ms. Naomi to make sure you get that presentation so you can actually see what I'm showing you this evening, unless IT is able to share my screen with you. Um, Tiffany, while you're sort of looking, I have a question about item number 10 on the bottom of page 10. Do you... Do you have that same thing in front of you or not? I do not have that document with me, and, um, unfortunately. Okay, well, my question is, it, it speaks specifically about tether on an animal on a vacant or abandoned property. Yes. So I know that that sounds like it would be easy to understand the difference of, of vacant and abandoned properties versus occupied or or leased properties yes but i know specifically within the city we have had property owners who are there's no one living in the property but they've had a tethered dog on the property yes and they supposedly bring food and water to it daily um I mean, does that need to be defined, what a, what a vacant and abandoned property is in order to further protect the, the animal? Well, what we're able to do is if we go to a location, as I said, this is a, a very, very common call that we respond to within city limits um, where um, it appears that the animal is not being cared for. Um, what we will do is two things. One, we will try to determine the owner of the dog. And if we're able to determine the owner of the dog, talk with them about what care is being provided to that dog. Um, also, you know, a lot of, there are tenants um, and property owners. And so obviously the property owner um, can help to inform us as to whether or not the tenant has the legal right to house the dog on that property when they're not living on the property and normally they do not. Um, if we are not able to identify an owner or speak with a property owner, then what we are legally allowed to do is to post the property for 24 or 48 hours. And then if there is no contact from an owner within that amount of time, then we are, we are legally allowed to remove that animal from the property. So there are already um, steps in place that can address that. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, so one example I wanted you to meet, um, this is an ongoing case that we have within city limits. I'm just referring to this dog as laundry line at this point in time because laundry line is unfortunately tethered to um, that laundry line that is up there. Um, as you can see, laundry line has no access to any shelter other than the slight overhang from coming off of the house. And as you can see, there is a bowl of water in the picture on the right and the food is scattered out on the ground. Um, without the, um, this ordinance amendment in place, there is unfortunately not a lot that we can do to assist Laundry Line in having a higher quality of life um, because the owner is um, arguing with us as to what is their uh, legal right as far as care of the dog. 
Um, I'd also like you to meet Hank. This is from within the city as well. Um, we appreciate working very closely with city zoning and city police officers on some of these more challenging cases that we run into. Um, uh, in this instance, the homeowner had a dog who was running loose, um, who was in perfect health. However, in the officer going out, um, a neighbor kept saying, I think there's another animal. I think there's another animal, but there was so much trash in the backyard that um, it wasn't easily visible from this, the street. However, my officer continued to return to the property and um, look over the fence until she was able to locate where Hank was being tethered to the ground. You can see on the left-hand side went uh, her first view of Hank. Um, he was a six-month-old puppy at the time and his entire life. He had been tethered to the ground with a tether that was so short that he was unable to lift his head off the ground. So he was permanently on his side on the ground in a curled position. And when Officer Holland cut him free, he was unable to straighten his legs because he'd been in a crouched position on the ground his entire life. The sad thing about Hank's situation is that um, less than five feet away from him was a bag of dog food that he was not able to reach. Um, you can see additional pictures uh, there in the middle that were taken as Officer Holland went in to free Hank. Um, fortunately, Hank does not hold a grudge against humans for the conditions that he was living in, and he is a wonderful dog. Um, his pupils are permanently dilated because of the conditions that he was living in. Um, however, I will show you as we progress through the presentation tonight that he has, uh, he is living his happily ever after now. Um, again, though, without this um, tethering ordinance, it, we are able to pursue cruelty in this situation, but the humane tethering ordinance would also give us more um, room to assist dogs like Hank. Um, so the question that comes up is why not ban tethering altogether? And that is a very good question and obviously something that we would like to work to uh, towards someday. But at this point in time, we don't feel that it is uh, something that is sustainable for us to enforce. And our goal is not to remove dogs from their families if their families care, but they're low income or they're inexperienced at um, housing dogs. We really would like to have the opportunity to educate them and keep the dogs with them instead of bringing their dogs into our shelter where we're often overcrowded and have to make um, very tragic decisions. Um, one of the reasons why we are not seeking to ban tethering altogether at this time is because there is a lack of fenced yards throughout Glen County and in the city as well. Um, I'm from the West Coast. It was very unusual to me when I moved here with my Georgia husband um, to see um, that people don't have the tall fences around all of their properties as I'm used to seeing. But there are, you know, there's not the fencing to hold dogs in on many of the properties. Um, we also know that pet ownership is saturated in Glen County. A few years ago, the Humane Society did a community survey that found that most of the people who are able to have pets or who want to have pets within the county already have them. So there is a lack of adopters for animals who are removed from homes and placed for adoption at our shelter and um, by the local rescue groups as well. Um, we also lack the resources and the number of officers to enforce a complete ban. Um, many other um, counties and cities who have tried to enforce a complete ban have had to hire an officer whose only role 40 hours a week is to respond to tethered dog calls. And of course, we don't have the ability to do that right now in our area. Also, as I mentioned, this gives us an opportunity to educate and to assist dog owners. And we often are given donated dog houses out at the shelter and my officers will give those to families who are trying to care for their dogs properly, but just may not have the funds to be able to purchase a dog house, we are more than happy to give them one of the donated dog houses so that they can improve their dog's lives, which also improves the human's quality of life as well. Um, one of the ways that we can educate is, as you can see here, um, two different types of ways to tether a dog. Now, while the picture on the left-hand side would not necessarily be a violation of the ordinance amendment, 
we would want to um, encourage the people to perhaps um, get the doghouse up off the ground, maybe give the dog some um, concrete blocks or something um, outside of the doghouse so that there's not just mud there for him. Um, there does appear to be a bowl behind the dog there. We would want to just educate them on the importance of having fresh food and water available at all times for their dogs. Um, but, you know, educate them that if they have the ability, a tether like the one on the right um, does make for um, a more comfortable living environment for their dog, which will cut down on the negative behaviors that um, make the neighbors upset. Um, although in this picture too, I'd like to see maybe the house raised up off the ground um, with a pallet or some blocks and perhaps some blocks on the outside. Um, so in summary, we respectfully ask you consider approving this humane tethering ordinance and looking to the future, we're working with the legal department on a proposal to add a livestock and farm animal ordinance. Georgia Department of Agriculture has changed um, their regulations to now require municipal animal controls to handle those types of calls. And we're also working to um, to propose a definition for the term shelter because um, right now without that definition people can lean a uh, piece of plywood up against the wall and say that that's shelter or um, you know tie their animal to the bumper of a car and say that by going underneath the car the animal has shelter and in our ordinances we need um, that definition in there to help us to um, you know, be able to say, no, a shelter has to have a floor, a roof, and three walls around it. So we'll be speaking with you further about that as we move through those steps. And then just to share with you, this is Hank now, the puppy who had been chained with his head pinned to the ground. Happily ever after, he transferred out of Glen County Animal Control, moved to a rescue group that placed him in a foster home and actually found a permanent family for him. Questions? How long did it take to get him a, a good home? Uh, it was approximately a six month process once we brought him in. He had to be in medical foster care for several months and then he was available for adoption for several months um, at the shelter, but because of his limited eyesight and his limited amount of socialization, he was not entirely thrilled with having other dogs around him. As I can imagine, he saw his partner dog freely leaving the property and eating as much as they want when he wasn't able to. So he was a little doggy, but um, so about after, it took about six months in total and getting him moved to another community that had- That's um, a great job, Tiffany. That's, that's yeah. super, really a great story. Thank you. Yes, a wonderful, very deserving dog from a very frustrating situation. I've got a question here that I don't think it's for you, Tiffany, but I will have one for you in just a minute. On page four, we say the city animal enforcement agent shall be charged with responsibility of enforcing the responsible dog ownership law. And then down below on page 4A, it says the uh, yes. county animal service director as a dog yeah. control officer. So. There's an error in a radom there, is that right? Well, I actually intentionally did that because this, since the Animal Control Services Director for the county is currently uh, what, what I would expect to be the dog control officer for that particular part of that code section. Um, because the dog control officer and dangerous dog hearing board, they, as you look further on into the um, ordinance, um, they are like the ones that take, classify, and, and look at these, the dangerous dog and that type, those types of things. And as present, um, the county is providing um, animal control services. So it might, maybe it would be better, um, maybe it would be better to read the City of Brunswick Board of Commissioners shall hereby designate um, an animal control officer as the dog control officer to perform there just had to be somebody named there and since we don't have a position within the city of brunswick that would take that responsibility i utilize the the counties and i might i don't know if it's a uh 
you know, my new point, but um, my title is actually Animal Control Division Manager. And if it were to the language of the law to say director, that would actually make um, Assistant County Manager Catherine Downs the person who would be oh, the dog okay. control officer, which I don't think she wants. I can pretty much <laughs> That she does not want to do that. So um, I don't know if that wording might need to be tweaked. Tiffany, would it be better if it said hereby designates the Glen County Dog Control Officer as the City of Brunswick Dog Control Officer? I think that uh, would that's, cover it. Okay, all right. Because I know the county's ordinance names one. And yeah, I don't think Catherine <laughs> might, get a, <laughs> might get a phone call in the morning from her if that's <laughs> where out we go. So I'll, I'll turn I the keys make, over to her. <laughs> no. I'll make that revision. If we got that hashed out on page five. Yes, sir. It, it says the city of Brunswick commissioners pursuant to so and so hereby recognize Glen County dangerous or vicious dog hearing board as the official hearing board of the city of Brunswick. Is the county aware of that? And uh, is the uh, hearing board aware of that? We do have a dog hearing board and they do um, know that um, we provide services for both the city and the county. That's good with me. I've got on page nine, you've got at to the top of the page, Tiffany, you've got a bunch of fees up there. How old are those fees? Those are, those are fees that, oh, well, I guess Tiffany might be able to, she might not have it in front of her. Tiffany, it was the fees that are pulled from y'all's section 2-4-21 um, to be uh, confiscation costs, the $12 per day plus yes. the pickup fee of $50. Is that still, I think if, if Commissioner Case is probably asking, one, if that's still accurate, and then two, how, how long has that been the case? Um, I, I've only been with animal control for two years now, but um, I, those are the current fees that we do use for impoundment. Okay. Right. Tiffany, now, if the resident, you know, if, if it's somebody who's a first time offender, their dog gets loose and we impound their dog and, you know, they're struggling, especially right now with all that's going on with business closures and so forth, we absolutely try to work with people. Um, perhaps, you know, some, I will sometimes even authorize um, waiving of part of the fee because sure. And we'd rather get the animal back with its caring family than have it at the shelter. Tiffany, how, how often are you unable to determine the owner of a, of a dog at large or a vicious dog? That's actually very frequent for us. We kind of have a joke that um, every dog, even if it's in the house with somebody, belongs to somebody's aunt's, uncle's, brother's, half-sister. Um, because, um, you know, people, especially if there's some sort of violation, tend to not want to claim that it's their dog. However, um, state law does um, provide more structure for us in the wording that whoever has um, current care and control of the dog is the person who's legally considered the owner, but that's kind of difficult to hold up in court, unfortunately. That's really, really unfortunate, and I know that's a big problem. It's extremely frustrating for my officers. As I said, we have a little inside joke about that. Um, and this question, I'm not sure who it's for, but in view of our lost arrangement with the county responding to animal control issues, how, how do these uh, revisions to the animal control ordinance affect that relationship? Uh, Tiffany, if it's all right, I'll field this one a little bit because this is something that was in my head as, we, as I drafted this. So first, you know, some of the, the issues we just worked through are in our ordinance presently written because of the law uh, structure. So that because the county does the city's animal control, as I did this ordinance amendment, I had to take that into consideration. Um, second, this ordinance amendment for the vicious, well, all of it, the tethering and the, the dangerous dog or responsible dog ownership law, it is more than anything bringing the city and county's ordinances into a more uniform state. Yes. So 
the, the purpose behind this is as when I went in to go look at the tethering and I talked to Jason Wilbanks is the assistant county attorney who helped, I think helped Tiffany and helped everybody with this. And as we discussed doing it, that's when I realized, hey, we're not in compliance. And if we're going to do this now, we need we, it, the best thing to do, similar to like the, the litter ordinance or the clean community ordinance. If we both share very, very similar ordinances, it's much easier to try to bring everyone into compliance. And if as a, if a county control uh, animal control officer brings a case in municipal court, they can rely on their internal knowledge, knowing that these two ordinances are very similar and almost directly uniform when it relates to it will directly uniform when it relates to tethering and extremely similar um, when it relates to the dangerous or vicious dog law. The only differences really would be some minor language in section numbers. That is very helpful to us um, to not have to refer to a separate um, city ordinance and county ordinance. And one of the things that we have found because um, the county adopted this ordinance um, amendment before the city had the opportunity to, um, we have had people saying, you know, why can't you do that? And, you know, just explaining to them the city is still going through their process and it's, you know, we're very hopeful that it will happen very soon. And so with that said, I do know that tonight is the first reading. Mayor, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, no, sir. So I think tonight is the first reading um, of this amendment. And I think that if it's the will of the commission, that I would ask if we'd be able to adver advertise or have Naomi advertise and then bring it back at the next meeting um, for final review and consideration of approval. Good with me. That'll be fine. I think uh, there's some sections that was uh, omitted, some numbers that uh, as we go through it, uh, I'll let you know. Four okay. that to 10 was omitted. Good, good with me. So, I'm fine. Yeah, okay. I'd like to say something, if I may, while Tiffany is there. Uh, can you hear me, Tiffany? I can. Uh, when we first started working on our dog ordinance, it seemed like everywhere I turned, I saw an excess of people riding around with their dogs in a pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> and we tried to take care of that in what we were doing. And I cannot tell you how many telephone calls I got from people all over the city of Brunswick in the county telling me that that was not that that dog was their property and that we had absolutely no no control over that animal whatsoever. And I'm so proud to tell you today that we listened to them. We did not, not do anything. However, I'm not seeing any animals in the back of pickup trucks today. I cannot tell you, and I'm so happy to report because it scares me. I can't stand to see one walking down the sidewalk by itself, any animal, not just a dog. I, I just can't stand it. And, I agree. And to see an animal in the back of a pickup truck flying down Highway 17 at 50 miles an hour terrified me. And, and uh, But that's honest. I, I can't remember the last time I've seen an animal in the back of a pickup truck. And I don't think that's due to COVID-19 either. I, I, <laughs> no, it does seem to be more rare. So now if we can get just get people to roll up the window a little bit so the dogs aren't completely hanging out the side of the window, we'll be good to go. Thank you very much. And hey, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you You're so welcome. much. You're um, welcome. Okay, uh, Ryan, you have your marching orders to go ahead and advertise it. Uh, get it with, to, to Naomi and she will take care of the rest. Thank you. All right. As we move right along, um, uh, Naomi, do we need a, a motion for this? No, Mayor, we don't. Okay, all right. Um, all right, item number 11, city manager's item, consider approval of cash handling and collection policy. Yes, um, and I will be brief. The city is has um, does not have a cash handling policy. And this basically is to ensure that we have proper handling of cash um, deposits, uh, you know, any transactions that are handling. And this not only takes care of cash, but it does also for other 
activities such as wire transfers, credit cards, and things like that. This policy was uh, vetted through the, it was um, developed by the staff, um, the finance director and the finance staff, as well as anyone who currently handles cash in the city, we gave them the opportunity to have input into the development of the policy so that we'll know how it will impact their jobs and that we'll know, you know, that they have, um, they can be in compliance with what we're trying to put in place. But basically it just uh, gives us the opportunity to have some proper procedures. The um, auditors have uh, suggested, it, the external auditors, of course, like to see things like this in place. Um, this helps us uh, in, you know, all of our handling of money and ensuring that if there's a problem that it can be corrected through disciplinary action and that kind of thing. Uh, we did present this information to the finance committee as well as the audit committee and um, basically would like for the commission to uh, approve this policy. Thank you. Or comments, commissioners? Looks good to me. I think it's really important to have this in place. Thank you for bringing it forward. I yeah, say it went through you. every, um, we've gone through a lot of reviews, so I think it's a solid policy and, and we'll be able to, um, you know, be complied. Is this going to be part of our, um, our policy manual that we have, uh, uh, personnel policy manual? Yes, and that's one of the reasons we're going through this procedure um, of approval. And, you know, we basically, we will be looking at further pro personnel policies as well, but we're kind of, um, you know, doing it, I guess, little by little so that we can get it done. Okay. Yep. Okay, consider it's been uh, approval by the Finance Committee and also the Audit Committee. Um, finance Committee, any further comments? No, Mr. Mayor, I think, you know, uh, after looking at it and, and after talking to Ms. Uh, about it, um, I think it's something that we really need and that we should move forward with it and put it in place for the benefit of the city and our employees. Okay. Commissioner yeah. Harris, do you have a comment? Let's move forward. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Then I entertain a motion, please. I'd like to offer a motion that we approve the cash handling and collections um, policy as presented by our city manager. Second. Motion second for the approval of the cash handling and collection policy as presented by our city manager. Any further comment, questions? Here in the all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed to have the same same right. Hearing none, seem like the eyes have it. So that motion carries. Okay, item number 12. Instead of approval of telework request form, working form, alternate location. I'll see the managers presenting again. As you know, during this COVID period, we have all um, had some time where people have been working from their homes and uh, teleworking, we're uh, basically just trying to put something in place so that we will have a proper procedure to follow. The telework um, policy will kind of establish requirements and guidelines for people who are commuting or telecommuting or teleworking. And the reason we think it's important now is because as we look going forward, we feel like we still may have challenges with keeping people um, if someone gets, uh, you know, have symptoms, if someone in the office is affected, there may be people have, that have to be quarantined. And in some cases, it's only one person or two people in that office. And it will allow us to make decisions in terms of allowing them to work from home and have a policy in place for that um, going forward. Any questions? And again, these um, policies were looked at by the staff and um, vetted, um, you know, just to make sure we were in compliance. It will require a, an approval process and a recommendation from the department and an approval by the city manager. Okay, I got one question. Wasn't, was this in our personnel policy manual as um, alternate work schedule or alternate work or something or, or not? 
I'm not sure if it was in there in this format. I would have to check and see. I, I agree. This is definitely needed. And I think um, um, you as the city manager should be the one to, to approve their work schedule and their work, uh, whether they should work telecommune or telework, e either one as well. So I'm, I'm happy with uh, the presentation of, of this, this policy. Well, that's after the recommendation of the department head. Is that right, Regina? Yes. 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 And then it goes to the city manager. Exactly. City Manager McDuffie and Mayor Harvey, this yes. is Tanette Myers. I did want to add, no, the city, our city uh, HR standard operations procedure manual does not have a existing policy in regards to telework or remote work. Okay. Um, so that's the reason why this policy was drafted and created. Well, thank you. I'll tell you, it's very well needed too. So thank you guys for doing that. I, I really appreciate that. Questions, comments? Do we have right now doing tel telework? We don't have anyone at the moment, but we did have someone um, a couple of weeks ago. And because of, you know, school schedules right now, um, the orders for um, allowing parents and people to telework are still in place under COVID. So we don't have anyone right now, but there may be anticipation of persons in the near future. Okay, thank you. Okay. I right, take the motion, please. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to offer a motion that we um, approve the teleworking request form uh, that has been presented by the city manager and all that she's said so far. <laughs> I got a motion. Second. I got a second. Um, for the consider approval of the telework request form working from an alternate location uh, and this be added to our personnel, HR personnel menu. Are there any further comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed at the same time. It seems the eyes have it. And that motion carries carry unanimously too as well. So thank you. Um, we had item number 12A, consider approval of community development block grant disaster recovery program grant consultant contract. City manager, either you or Ms. Mr. Stegall is presenting. I am going to start off this presentation. Um, I know you all have gone through a lot of this information before. I will start off by saying um, I will give as much information, I mean, some brief summary information as needed. This is a big ask. This is the DR program. Um, DCA is very anxious for us as a community to get this program started. And I think we presented some information. This is for the a recommendation for Tidal Basin to be the contractor to administer the grant for this program. And I will share my screen for a minute to give you all some information. Um, let's see. We, we received uh, four different proposals for um, this particular project. Uh, BizQuick, Blue Links, Tidal Basin, and GMC pre presented proposals. The amount shown was the initial amounts that were given um, for the RFP that went out. The scoring was based on the following criteria of price, qualification, approach, MWBE, and Section 3 business participation. We went through a vetting process with DCA staff to look at all of the proposals, to look at the strengths, weaknesses of the um, proposers, and to look at how well they met the qualifications that were set out in the RFP. The RFP itself was developed by DCA as well. Um, we chose, and DCA was in agreement, that Tidal Basin, and this is, should be Tidal Basin, and GMC were the proposers that gave solid proposals that had proper qualifications to administer the grant. And believe you me, I was not happy with looking at the prices and the 
scopes that they had given. I, I was very alarmed by that. But once we went through the vetting process with DCA and they saw the numbers and I realized that if they saw the numbers and were okay with what we were doing, that meant that they would support reimbursement of the grant consultant amounts associated with the contracts. Um, so we, after that particular process, went into, I guess, looking more closely at both of the proposals that came out on top and offered them uh, revisions of their proposals. Um, they came back a second time with lesser um, costs, but there were some other things that we went through in terms of how they were going to administer the program um, and some of the unit prices that we wanted to look at. We felt like Title Basin would be a better um, proposer for various reasons and that they had a lot of experience with disaster recovery. So what we're recommending is that we go with the contract with Tidal Basin and this price, 775,964, I will ask for a slight amendment of that price. And that amendment will be um, just to add about $4,000, which would have a contract price of $779,414 for approval. I'm going to go back to, um, let me, are there any questions about, I'm going to go back to, this is the, the, the information from HUD on this program. We are one of the most impacted and distressed zip codes, which is 31520, which the allocation overall is $30, 30 million dollars. Of that, this program is the homeowner rehabilitation and reconstruction, which is about eight million eight million dollars. And of that, our area gets a portion of this 6.4 million. What we think and what has been um, shown to us is that our uh, FEMA, and I'll have to go out of this screen to, to, um, to share this, but in the FEMA value, I guess, where they, the verified loss by FEMA shows that, and I'll get to that in just a second, shows that the Brunswick area right here for Glen County, and this is the county Brunswick and Glen County, our FEMA verified loss is about $3.1 million. So that's kind of what we're basing our proposal on is our recovery of that $3.1 million in loss. Um, and our share of what the um, cost of rehabilitation and reconstruction should be. We are going to work really hard. And one of the most important things I thought of this was that they are not only looking at um, properties that are uh, owned, they're also, they did a disaster by residence types. So they're even looking at 60% um, of the properties may be rental properties, which I think is important in this community because there is a lot of rental properties that need rehabilitation as well. Um, the only other thing I was going to point out here was uh, just looking at some of our demographics. And this, all of this information, I'm sure you all have gone through, I guess a couple of years ago, probably based on the time schedule. Um, but just knowing that our, we met most of these qualifications and, and basically was probably of all the three areas that are listed here was the most distressed. Um, and we, you know, have the opportunity to have a big impact on our community um, with this particular grant. So at this point, are there any questions? I have, <clears throat> excuse me, one question. So the three million that uh, the city is hopeful of, of being able to be awarded uh, based on damages, that roughly seven hundred eighty thousand dollars. Does that does that amount come out of the three million, or that's a, that's uh, HUD HUD's going to cover that cost of administering the grant? Well, I'm not going. 
as far as they have told us is that no, the 779,000 will be in addition to. And one of the reasons I had a conversation, um, I guess it's been about when I first started, when I got here about a month, less than a month after I got here, I got a call from the um, deputy commissioner of DCA. And he basically, he's a, a associate that I've known for a while. He basically told me that this, you know, grant was really, really important to be administered. So um, when my conversation with him was, you know, I really want, if we are getting $3 million, then my, you know, direction is that that $3 million be spent on rehabilitation and reconstruction. And that was the one, one of the reasons why when we got the proposals in, I was very alarmed because I was like, that's, you know, 20%, 30% of the grant. So yeah. that has been my conversation with DCA every time I talk to them. And the reason I bring it up as the deputy commissioner is because I told him specifically, I want $3 million to hit this community. I don't care if we have to pay for the administration because a lot of the administration is being dictated by DCA. I think, you know, if we were on our own, we would not have to have met so many parameters in that RFP. But because they directed it, that's the reason it's costing and, you know, it has a lot of things in it. So what I told him was since they're making us pay for all this or they're, you know, they should be the one paying for it. And right. so hopefully we will get our, it'll be uh, $3.7 million. So the, the pot of money comes from HUD, but it's filtered down and administered and awarded through DCA to, to us and, and I guess a couple of other communities. Okay. Cause I, I felt the same way you did when I saw that number. I, I it just about <laughs> made my heart. Oh, so believe you me, we, we immediately got on the phone with DCA and the only reason I felt comfortable and Travis can chime in at this point is that DCA went through that with us and, you know, basically looked at it and said, yes, these will be reimbursable costs through the program. And I don't want to get too far afield, but when you were talking about rental rental properties, um, and that you know, 60% of the properties that that sustain some damage or need to be rehabilitated are rental properties. Um, I'm assuming that um, the property owners would have to qualify in order to to have that HUD money spent on their property. I mean, if if they if they truly don't have the wherewithal to rehab the property versus somebody who just not willing to spend the money. <laughs> well, and, and those were conversations. I think they will have to have some verification, but I was just glad to see because normally through DCA and HUD processes, they don't allow, you know, a lot of rehabil rehabilitation or reconstruction of rental property. Yeah. But because they realized that these properties were damaged, and the fact that, you know, they were not being rehabilitated, they are allowing that to, to at least be a part of the equation. And to add something, and to add something to that really quick is, um, though there may be a case of them being rehabbed, we probably, they're last on the list behind owner occupied properties, right? So, um, and we, you know, so I don't want, you guys to think that there's going to be a high number of rental properties there. So if there's anything left for rental rehab, that will happen. But a majority, it, it's a tiered system. So um, the low to moderate income seniors come first, homeowners next. Um, and this particular program, it doesn't matter your income, but it does matter in a tiered effect of who was the most affected and need the most help. Thank you. So is this for rehabilitation only or does this apply to demolition and rebuild or? Yes, it does. Um, as of right now, we are only guesstimating that there may be one, maybe two um, rebuilds only because there's a 
there's a particular metrics that meets that you have to meet in order to get a rebuild started. And so we have to be really careful of that number because right now that number is if a renovation project gets to about $75,000, then we have to start thinking about um, a rebuild. Uh, with some of the homes right now that are currently at their values, we're gonna have to kind of take that case by case, but we don't really see a property right now being that high in, in, um, in any, kind of rehab. We're probably thinking anywhere from the 20 to 40. The other reason why is this. These funds are last and gap dollars, which means that if you had $10,000 worth of, um, of damage, if you had $10,000 worth of damage and you got $5,000 from FEMA or insurance, then we only pay that remaining $5,000. Are we restricting uh, what these they can use the, the funding for? Will you give me an example of what you're thinking? In other words, uh, you know, they get five thousand dollars. You know, they say, "Well, I, I know I need it to to uh, do something else or whatever." Are we restricting what they can use those funds for? Uh, well, unfortunately, the the answer is yes. Um, DCA has given us a very long yes, but it is a yes. Yes, I understand. Mayor, we will develop, the, the contractor will develop scopes of work. Yes. And that will be the work that will be done. That's what They'll have to go through a vetting and approval process. Right, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, any questions? Let me, let me, let me, let me yeah. yeah, let me ask this question. So then an individual who, be it a renter or a homeowner or a of, of, you know, person that rents. Yes. Landlord, that's what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> they would have to um, have a contractor to look at the scope of work and then propose that scope of work to the city before before any funds are, are allocated or any funds are presented to anyone. Oh, yeah. And the funds... Funds aren't going to be presented to anyone. Funds will be paid to contractors for work that is performed. Right, okay. and so what happens is, is that we go out and do an assessment. This program is generally ran the way that we generally run our um, CDBG program currently, but we will go out and do the assessment. We will say what is storm damage, what's not storm damage, uh, assess a value to it. Once we assess a value to it, put it out for bid amongst um, a group of contractors. Some of them are local, some of them are not. But we'll put those bids out. They will bid on the project itself. And based on the lowest cost, most qualified contractor, that's how that happens. Okay, so it's the same process that we use for, for other funding that we do with uh, housing, the CDBG. Absolutely. But like I said, um, I really want to let it be known that we we do have funds, we do have limited amount of funds, and owners of rental properties will literally be last on the list. Now, the great thing about that is that Miss McDuffie was as she was showing the number of renters that were affected. Um, part of these dollars, you got a chance to see on her chart that there was about $12 million that was set aside for multifamily housing. Um, we went with Bill Gross for the old um, school, yard, school bus yard site um, and was able to help fund a project to provide affordable housing for individuals that were affected by the storm on that site. Oh, good. Um, I have one question, and that is the contracted amount, I'm, ass I'm assuming that is a set contract price for the duration of the, the, the full funding through HUD, um, as opposed to any additional fee schedule above and beyond this contract amount that they would hit us with. Is that correct? 
that is our understanding. And we will go through and, and develop a contractual agreement with Title Basin. Okay. And that contractual agreement will be vetted by DCA and make sure it meets all of the criteria. And that's why we're putting up to that amount. And yes, we are contracting up to that amount. And we don't, um, are not necessarily accepting any other fees or fee schedules at this point. Okay, well, I'm, I'm very glad to have the support as I'm sure y'all are of DCA and moving through that whole process then. Yes, that's one of the things I am going to work very closely with them and make sure that they are aware of everything that, you know, goes through and basically so that we won't have any problem with, you know, reimbursements and moving forward. What kind of staff will these, uh, the title people have? Uh, they will have program, a program manager, they will have case managers, they will have uh, construction um, uh, inspectors um, and people, but based on how many cases we are, you know, going to watch really closely, we're not going to allow them to have three case managers and not have the volume of cases to process, you know, without having the volume of um, yeah, the volume of cases to process. So, so is there a template for how this has been done anywhere else or is this brand new? So it's sort of kind of brand new. Um, the only individuals that run a program like this now is the state of Georgia. It's the first time that Georgia has done it. And Texas was the first one to um, successfully implement these grant dollars in this manner. And I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now to show you all kind of a breakdown, there it is, that has the um, program manager, has the construction services manager, um, case managers, and that type of thing. So all of those costs are itemized and they have unit costs associated with it. So we will, you know, continue to track how many units and that kind of thing that they're working all throughout this process. Okay, how about our staff? Will, will our staff be involved with the administration of any of this? There will be staff under the city. We are, we have already hired through the grant um, a program manager for the city and there also will be a construction manager to oversee some of the process for the city. And they've already been hired? Uh, the program person has. And how is the cost for, for uh, that employee being covered? That's the $300,000 of grant money that was provided before. Okay. And anything that we tend to do that's associated with this program, um, as far as even bringing 503 Mansfield online is reimbursable through the uh, grant. We're just we're just um, being very cautious in making sure that we get more money into the hands of the citizens and onto the properties, um, and not administration. Is, is any of this Davis Bacon? Yes. Whenever you are working with any of the contractors. I'm sorry. It's, it's well, I was just saying because we're the money is ultimately federal money. Yes. So we'll be using their rates. They will be required to, I think, adhere to Davis Bacon, as far as I I know. Okay. So Regina, the. CDBG DR Outreach Center, which is what that initial 300,000 is going towards. That's sort of like the first point of contact. That's the first layer of, of uh, applicants who, who need to apply for, for this funding. Is that correct? And then it filters on through there. Now, we're setting up the Outreach Center at Mansfield, the Mansfield building. Right. The contractor will be working out of that building and they will be the ones initiating the outreach 
um, programs. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at um, this, the, the very first page, the section about facts and issues. Mm -hmm. Where it just said the city has been awarded an initial 300,000 to create a CDBGDR outreach center. That, yeah, that's the setting up of Mans the Mansfield building and having our program manager being paid out of that $300,000. Okay. And then that's, that's what I was thinking conceptually is the, the first layer. That's the immediate okay. on the ground, uh, you know, contact point for our citizenry and, and folks within the city and the county. Right. Okay. And they will be working out of that facility as well. Okay, any further questions? Yeah, the program uh, person that was hired, was this job advertised? Yes. Yes, it was. And we, do we hire somebody locally here or? Yes. You can answer that. Yes. I haven't seen an ad. I, don't, I missed some stuff, so I must I remember the ad. Um, um, no, I'm not doubting you. I, believe yeah. me, I, I missed it. So who who is it? We, we, you say we hired somebody locally. Yes. So who did you hire, Mr. Stegall? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Roxanne George, actually. Um, not only did she apply, but she was also highly referenced by uh, Ms. Dominique Mack. And she starts when? Uh, have she started already? She starts. Yes. Oh. Okay. So we have that. Have, have we got the funds already to start paying employees? We are putting a process in place to get reimbursed for that payment for that employee. Yes. Okay. So when will they open the doors at 503 Mansfield? So we will have our doors open um, anytime after the 15th. We are hoping to start taking applications on the 1st of September. Okay. Um, one of our goals is we're going to have to bring this back, I believe, on the 15th um, for a final approval of contracts. Seven days after that, we have a team meeting with the new vendor which should put us around the 21st, 22nd. Um, between the 21st and the 2nd, and the 1st is when we start our marketing campaign with some of our community partners, um, our radio ads, and we'll start taking applications starting September the 1st of those individuals who have come in over the past and picked up um, checklists and just kind of started months ago trying to gather information. And so from September the 1st, we will be receiving applications and um, starting to help the citizens of Brunswick. So um, in light of what you just said, Travis, how much of that, if any, will filter back through the city commission for approval or is, or is everything going to be set up in place that, mm -hmm. that it just it, it rolls and cycles through based on the administrative assistance that's being set up and the contract and uh, with Title Basin, et cetera? Uh, yes, yes, okay. yes. And we will give updates to the commission. I, I would hope that we would have some good news about applications, about the eligibility process, and certainly share all, the, all of that information as it comes about. Right, thank you. All right, any further comments? I know we're glad for this to start happening. We've been worried, thinking about this for a couple of years now, and finally we are getting uh, to see some money flow through and get this program started and help our citizens, especially a lot of the ones that will happen in the College Park area due to the flooding and so forth. Um, commissioners, we are here. I'll entertain a motion if there are no further uh, questions or comments. Uh, I'll 
make a motion that we approve the um, community development block grant disaster recovery program implementation and administration contract with Tidal Basin in the amount not to exceed $779,964. Second. It's been probably motion second um, uh, for, for the approval of uh, this item. Uh, then any further questions or comments? Uh, the only question I would have, do we need to add the authorization for the mayor to sign the agreement for the contracted services to that motion? I think I automatically signed it. Ask now. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. All right. Ma'am, are you still on the call? Still on with us? Yes, Mayor. Okay, call the roll for me, please. Commissioner Kaysen, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Martin? Yes. Mayor Harvey? Yes. All right. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, um, Mr. Stiegel, and thank you, um, Madam City Manager, and also everybody, other staff as well. Thank you so very much. All right, we had item, uh, last item, item 12B, uh, consider approval of resolution number 20-20-14, authorization to execute the coronavirus relief funds terms and conditions agreement. Mr. City Manager, you are presenting. The only, I mean, this is a resolution that is being circulated by GMA. It is one that is required. Um, we have uh, signed on to the Georgia CARES portal and they are requiring us to have a resolution in place in order to um, authorize funding and to accept funding for the CARES uh, relief fund. So that's, this is basically the agreement that they put in place for that. And um, I ask for you all's approval. Have we started receiving our monies yet? Have we? I have. Um, I I wanted to check. I didn't ask Kathy to check today, but from what I've heard, um, I signed up on that portal three days ago, and most okay. places have gotten their money after three days. And it does say on the portal that our status of the two hundred and fifty-five thousand right. is approved. So. So we're just waiting right now. Yeah. The money, the money's in the middle. This morning, it had not come in today. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, we'll keep checking. Tomorrow, let us know. Please let us know. We're waiting with baby. <laughs> and we are looking very closely at how to spend the money and making sure that we are within the parameters that are set. We also are will be participating in some training next week in regards to the CARES Act funding. Yeah, someone asked me uh, a question about, I know um, the county is going to get a million dollars. Uh, we're going to get uh, 255000 or whatever. Um, is in that, um, you know, we plan on trying to help other organizations, right, who are going to need some help, such as our medical personnel, medical facility. Mm -hmm. What about uh, our college? Uh, do they, uh, or do they, since they're state funded, they don't, they don't share in um, but they're part of our community. So will you check on that for me, please? The college, you're saying? Yes. We'll look into that as well. We're we're just trying to, I have a meeting with um, Alan Hours, and we are going to, you know, try and see what we can coordinate, but I will add the college into that. Um, okay. All right, thank you. This is just the first phase. Yes, it is. It. 30%. Yeah, wow. I, um, that yeah, we we are gonna get. Uh, I think is is it eight hundred thousand dollars or? or Ten percent. Let me share my screen again. Here's our money right here. Um, Glen County, Brunswick City, eight hundred and fifty thousand. That's the full amount. The two hundred and fifty-five thousand is the thirty percent. The unincorporated area there. Total amount is 3.6 million. Their 30% is a million dollars. Um, and we're, we will work really, really hard to try and make sure that all of those dollars are spent or brought into this community. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, um, uh, this, this executive order uh, has to be signed by, by all, all concerned, all the mayor and commissioners. 
So, um, um, and it's required so we can get our money uh, to help our community, to help our citizens here. Most Let's see if we can't get DocuSign in place for the city of Brunswick. Excuse me? Let's see if we can't get DocuSign in place for the city of Brunswick. I believe we have some of that already, but... Uh, they um, only may be able to take care of that. Well, ask Naomi to take care of that, too. I mean, be able to check check it out. Uh, uh, entertain a motion, commissioners. I made a motion to approve, Mr. Miller. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sorry, you did. I, did. I got a second, too, didn't I? Second. Yes. All right. <laughs> Probably motion second for the approval of resolution number 2020-14. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, those who are against have the same right. It seems the ayes have it. That motion, that motion carried. So we're at the end of our regular printed uh, agenda. Is there any need for executive session? We do have a litigation update. We do? We do. Um, I believe, I know I let Naomi know, I'm not sure if there was an executive session link sent out. It could, <laughs> it could potentially wait until the 19th if that is the will of the commission, um, but it's not a time sensitive update. Okay. I know we've kind of had a long meeting tonight, so it's up to the commission. Commissioner, if it's uh, the will of you all, we'll wait till the next next meeting. I'll make a motion we adjourn. I second it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. That's loud and clear. Well, this has been probably more than a second for adjournment. Before I go, I'd like to tell everybody thank you for a great meeting tonight. Thank you for all your input. Thank you, staff, for doing a great job. Thank you all, Commissioner, for all the input that we've done. We've done a great thing. We are really um, – we're divorced for this community and, and we are really uh, stepping up and we have uh, uh, got a responsibility and we're doing um, some great things for our community. Some of the things people don't re recognize or, or give us credit for, but it's okay because we were elected to, to go and do the best thing, make decisions for our community. I thank you all for, for doing that. I thank you the staff for being who they are and, and bringing great, um, things to us so we can make decisions. So with that said, uh, all in favor of uh, adjournment, please say aye. 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 All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Hey, Good amen. Good Thank you, everyone. Stay Have a good there, night. Everybody. Good job. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Brian, we look forward to that. Um, Let's sleep here. He's gone already, isn't he?